Hello and welcome to Harry Potter and the Rewind Reviews. Uh, thank you for joining our nerdy book club, where every week uh, for the next, well I guess there's ten weeks left now, um, we're going to sit down and we'll suffer through a Harry Potter movie, starting with the ones that are alright and getting to the ones where a horse picks the president. So how are you feeling about uh, about this, Dan? You feeling good? You feeling excited? You... <laughs> um, you know what? I am enjoying this because it is it is it is good fun to pick them apart. But I will say this week, Chris, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and stop us from getting so nitpicky for so much of it by asking wider questions about the movie and whether it functions instead of okay. n- n- you know allowing myself to spend the entire podcast. Putting on my my special my special gl- glasses that I only wear during these podcasts, where they're, they're, they're the only round pair of glasses I wear. I'm oh, kidding, I don't do that. But it wouldn't it be great if I just had like a pair of like Harry Potter round glasses that I only whip out when we record a podcast that involves Harry Potter. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna put them on and I'm gonna push up my nose with one finger and go <clears throat> in the book. <laughs> I think you'll find. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try and resist doing that as much this week because I feel like I came out of last week going, man, we spent a lot of time doing that. But the problem is with these first two, they're so so much just the book in terms of like the plotting and the character mm-hmm. development like it's it's the book literally adapted in a in a really direct way and i think they get further away from that um from this point on um to the point where the last ones are really really different to the books in many many ways and there'll be lots to talk about um Whereas these ones, they're so close, it almost begs comparison in that sort of way. So I'm hoping we can um, avoid that this week. Or at least, not completely, obviously, but as, as, as much as possible. I've made some notes like that, but I've not made many. Um, not Certainly not as many as last week. <laughs> um, mm. So with that in mind, um, how are you feeling about this one? Uh, well, what did you? What if overall? Did we start jumping with overall thoughts? For those who want to know yeah, our yeah. sort of impressions of the franchise, you can listen to the start of last week's podcast where we did quite a lengthy bit on our, our how we got into the series originally, where we are at with it now. Um, but in terms of this movie, Chris, what what are you thinking? I I really enjoyed this movie. Like, mm. and I I I I'll tell you now, like, because after we finished, I was like, because I went into it going. I think I enjoy this one more than a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. And then we watched it and went, yeah, no, I do, I do enjoy this. I do enjoy this movie quite a bit. And then I looked at Harry Potter ranked articles to see if I was right. And most of them put this last, like not if they include the Fantastic Beast movies, but if it's just Harry Potter, a lot of people really? put this Cause, last. Because I yeah. think I said last week, this might be the best one. I, I'm pretty sure I said that last what? week. On the yeah, podcast. no. If you look at if you look at like um, I'll try and pull some up, but like yeah, there was just a bunch. Not Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't have it last. Um, but I'll, while you talk, I'll I'll pull some up. But the they and a, a big complaint was about it being long and about how the book yes. isn't that long, so it doesn't need to be that long. But it doesn't even feel that long to me. I think what I really like about this film, uh, in comparison, the first one felt a little bit like this is the mirror sequence and then this is the this is the christmas sequence and then this is the revealing fluffy sequence like it just it felt like um a few uh, some different moments that kind of came together at the end but came together better if you knew the books um whereas this one i it just felt more flowing than that it felt like everything was about the chamber of secrets it felt like it pacing wise i actually thought it was it was paced Mm -hmm. quite well i have some i have some nitpicks you know the 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 last scene has a, a a number a number of kind of basically from the point from the point where Lucius Malfoy is about to deliver the killing curse in Hogwarts ground <laughs> to a child. Yeah, it, yeah. you know, the, the, from that point, from yeah. that point, they're just like <laughs> slow, slow clap when when Hagrid comes in. It, eventually, yeah, why not? Like from that point onwards, it's just all a bit weird and awkward. But before that, uh, can I tell you I right now? Think... Can I tell you right now? Just no, small spoilers. I think that's one of the best changes. I love that moment. I I love that moment best. so much when I watched what, it. When the clap or or Lucius Malfoy. 
Oh, sorry, no, the, yeah, the clap for Hagrid, sorry. I thought that was yeah, so like, sweet and so lovely. And it made me go back. I, genuinely, Chris, I went to the shelf. Let me put this here. I went to my shelf and I pulled off my copy of uh, Chamber of Secrets. And I found well, the chapter. Well, before, well, before it, you... Can I, can yeah, I see if my memory's right then? Because my memory of it is... Hagrid's basically there's joyous celebration throughout in the Great Hall that night, and Hagrid's return is more sort of, and yet the place really truly erupted when Hagrid returned or something like that. Yeah, you're not far off, except for it's it's like one line. It's like it's it's here we go. Uh, <laughs> Harry had been to several Hogwarts feasts, but never one quite like this. Everybody was in their pyjamas. Celebrations lasted all night. Harry didn't know whether the best bit was Hermione running towards him, screaming, you solved it, you solved it. Justin, hur- Justin hurrying over from the Hufflepuff table to wring his hand and apologise endlessly for suspecting him. Or Hagrid turning up at half past three, uh, cuffing Harry and Ron so hard on the shoulders that they were knocked into their plates of trifle. Um, or his and Ron securing several points for Gryffindor in the House Cup. So it's literally, that's it. It's that, it's, the, <laughs> it's or Hagrid turning up, Half past three, hitting Harry and Ron so hard on the on the shoulders that they fall into the trifles. That's it. That's the line. It's all it mm. is. I, I and, and mm. while I understand it's a short book, and you're not going to sit there describing every moment of the celebration in, in detail. It's a it's a choice she made when writing that book. I've got to say, seeing all the kids like and their affection for Hagrid and there's no Hogwarts without you without you Hagrid that, that was so sweet and I and I was really taken aback by it really surprised by it and it does show that Columbus really does understand the books I think um, because I do think that's how the kids feel about Hagrid I do think that I think that most of the the students would have been very pleased to see him back oh yeah yeah for sure uh, but it's just not in the book she doesn't actually just put, she doesn't put that you know she doesn't put pen to paper and actually put those words in there but it's you know it, it it's enough in the text of it that you understood that's what so it just feels very a very natural extension of what's in the book. This is this this really good adaptation rule uh, work there because it is just again it's like a thing that makes perfect sense to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if somebody told me oh yeah yeah um in, and in the book when Hagrid comes back and everyone claps and I'm like ah actually that's just in the film you'd be surprised like yeah I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised sorry, if somebody genuinely mixed those two things up because it does feel such a natural extension of what's already happening. So I love that moment so much. Did not care yeah. for Lucy Malfoy losing his temper to the point of nearly murdering a child on Hogwarts grounds for the for the for the for the, for the mere act of throwing a sock at Dobby uh, or getting That's a sock weird. to Dobby. It's ridiculous. That's weird. Yeah. I have a I have a I have a weird thing with Dobby, which we'll talk about um, after you've given your review thoughts. So yeah, to conclude, I, I I had a really good time with this film. I actually like, I don't want to spoil ranking now. But I'd place it higher than the first. It just seems like a smoother ride. Maybe it's because it has less introductory stuff to do. I thought but about the, that. You know, the 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 actings. Was, I think the acting. You know the people that you know Daniel Radcliffe. Well, basically, I say it. Daniel Radcliffe's acting. I think is a lot stronger in this. Um, mm-hmm. I think that um, Kenneth Branagh adds an awful lot to yes, it. He does. Um, what a what a stunning performance as Gildry Lockhart. Um. Uh, yeah. So I think it 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 ramps up, and there's not so much. Uh, the the bastard. I can't remember. Maybe you'll be able to tell me. I can't remember whether in the book the the fact that the I I can't remember in the book what prompts him to stab the diary with the fang because obviously, and I can't remember whether we find out after that Baslick blood is very powerful or whether that's led in and Harry knows that. I mean, but I'm sure it's smoother in the book than it is in the film where Harry's just randomly like, well, I'll stab it with this, see if that works. <laughs> like, and they well, don't I really think, explain I, that. If memory so serves, and I, I haven't reread the book for a little while. My memory serves is he realises he needs to destroy the diary. He figures out the diary is the source of this this riddle and and, and 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 if he destroys it it'll save Ginny but he no longer has access to the sword so he he literally grabs the only thing that he has available to him because it's he, I think he literally has just pulled the fang out, out of his leg like right. so I, I think that's why the, it, in the movie it definitely plays out more awkwardly and less less sort of uh, right logically I guess because the yeah, sword is right a... there in the movie <laughs> so you just sort of think <laughs> Use the sword. Yeah, well, that was almost my memory of it. But that's, uh, but so that you know, there look, there are there are nitpicks for sure. 
But I yeah. think it's very... I don't think I have a particular problem with the pacing. I think it, it romps along. Along Is that... What's beeping? Oh, my alarm. Hold on, I'll get that in a second. Um, the... I think it goes along quite nicely. I think there's real magic in, you know, some of the scenes with the car um, and a lot of the sequences, I think, are very good in the film. Um, The forest scene with Aragon, etc. I think the effects mostly are a bit a bit stronger. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there weren't too many moments I could point at and go, oh, that that CGI hasn't held up, etc. Um, I think they, you know, there's some character stuff that, you know, they could explore deeper. I think Ginny should have more of a presence throughout the film. Um, like she's sort of in the, it, take a shot, sorry, but in the book, her gradual descent and um, feeling nervous and there clearly being something going on with her is played up a bit more. So this this film mm-hmm. suffers again from that trait of, you want to do the thing at the end, but you're not putting in the payoff stuff, which actually would be quite. E- you're not doing mm-hmm. in. The, you're not embedding the build, which would be quite easy to do. Um, but I. But even that, I think it maybe does slightly less than the first one. So yeah, overall thoughts. I had a. I had a good time with this movie. I. I really like it. And if we're to, you know, I don't know when we we're, we're doing ranking each time, but I'm. I'm doing it. I'm putting this film above the first one in my personal ranking. Yeah, I, I think what? as we go on, we'll probably save rankings till towards the end. But I think yeah. for this one, because there's only two, and it's pretty clear, I think we both preferred this one. Um, uh, yeah, I think this for me as well. It, so far, two above one. Um, and we'll see how we go as the rest of these go. Maybe, maybe we'll do it at this time in every podcast where we're doing general thoughts, because we'll probably be giving away how we felt about it. Um, and then going into detail. I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go. But yeah, I, for me, two two over one as well. Um, I, I think the reason... I, I, I've been thinking about it. I think it's in many fold the reason this one works better. I think, first of all, I think the script writers just had a better sense of like... Because it's the same writer, right? It's the, 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 the first one, I believe. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, yeah, I think I think he stays for quite a while. Actually, I'll look it up. Oh, isn't this the guy that writes all of them but one? He just yeah, doesn't I write. Or, is so. it Order of the Phoenix or something? He doesn't write a goblet. One of the ones right in the middle. I think he also Cl- wrote Cloves, he, right? Isn't it Cloves? Yeah, I think he's. I'm pretty sure he's also written uh, Fantastic Beasts or at least Fantastic Beasts with J.K. Maybe. Or... Let me let me uh... let me let me get my. Yeah, Steve Cloves, who, let me pull up his IMDb and see how many Harry Potter films are on it. I think you're right. I think you are bang on. Yeah, he wrote Secrets of Dumbledore. Oh, but he didn't work on the other foot, the first two. Those are just JK. But of the original... No Order of the Phoenix, you were right. No Order of the Phoenix, he's written all the others. Yes, okay, great. Um, well, he does. He, I think he gets a better sense here of how to make this story function because, and, well, okay, I'll say why though. I think it's, he's got an easier job here. So it's two reasons. One, so they're at Hogwarts and the story sort of begins in terms of the quarrel stuff in the first movie by chapter six, chapter seven, after the sorting oh, wait, chapter. So, sorry, can I correct ourselves a little bit? Apologies. He, he was producer on the uh, first two Fantastic Beasts, but he didn't write them, but he wrote the third with J.K. Rowling. Yes, well, I already said that. Oh, did you say that? Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, I said yeah, I, th- I said he just wrote the fight. The fi- he just wrote on the recent uh, Fantastic Beasts. He didn't write the first two. Right, so. Um, yeah. Not true. Um, not true. Uh, so, 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 in the uh, in the books, mm. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do it in that voice now to deter myself from doing it. Um, he, the, 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 the first one, he's at the school and the story with Quirrell and the mystery of the Philosopher's Stone really doesn't kick in until sort of chapter eight, chapter nine. But in the the Chamber of Secrets book, you know, he's at the school and we're already getting clues as to the big mystery by chapter sort of four or five. So just by default, the the, the, the there's a smoother transition from this section of the story that's about him learning about the wizard world to this section of the story, which is his first adventure in the wizarding world. Uh, so what that means is you can kind of... M- you can kind of trim a lot of those early chapters out completely in this, you know, in this, but not completely, but in like, you could really, really shorten how much time he spends with the Dursleys, for example, to focus on Mm. the Chamber of Secrets story. But also the Chamber of Secrets story throughout the book is way less ongoing. It also bitty than the Philosopher's Stone mystery because the Philosopher's Stone mystery, you don't really know. There's no thrust for that. Even in the book, it's Harry's at school doing his, you know, going through his teen school nonsense. 
And in the background, there's these hints that something is going on that develop into this plot thread that turns out to be a plot to steal it, that he tries to stop. Chamber of Secrets, the thing that's going badly is, you know, the thing that's happening that's negative in the school is happening from pretty much day one in the school. So that through line ties all the sequences together better on page before you even get to a film adaptation than the first one. Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just that the first one's structure is more acceptable in a book than it is in a film. So you don't notice it until you do this and you're forced to analyse why one film works over the other when they basically had the exact same creative team. And it's significantly better, I think, as well. Um, I, and I genuinely think um, that the, the ability to just make this story, this one thrust, which is Harry in the school, people are getting petrified. The school thinks he did it. He's doing it. And he starts to doubt himself. It's a much clearer character arc and story and thrust than we think there might be a thing maybe in the school that might be being potentially stolen that maybe we'll we'll, we'll investigate slightly, but we don't really know what we're doing because we're children. Um, <laughs> which is such a such a harder plot to explain. Like, try to tell someone the plot of Philosopher's Stone. Like, the school plot. Like, you know, in a sentence. Whereas... You know, it's so much easier to sum up what's going on in this movie. And as a result, it leads to a more cohesive script. Um, and then, of course, you're right. It's things like Branner, who is just having so much fun. And I love him for it. I mean, it's it's a glorious performance. Uh, maybe one of the best in this whole series, genuinely. But bits of casting. It's, it's so good. The, it actually yeah. made me sad at the end that we didn't get um, the, 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 you know, the more... Brain wiped Gilderoy Lockhart stuff because that's because that's like the best, some of the best Gilderoy Lockhart stuff in the book. Obviously, I love Smug, overconfident when he's not earned it. Gilderoy Lockhart, that's all great, but the payoff that's in the book is so good when he's just like absolutely out of his mind and <laughs> double doses. Dumbledore says, ah, you seem to have fallen on your own, your own sword there, Gilderoy, referring to the memory charm. And Gilderoy goes, sword? Oh, no, I've not got a sword. That boy has one, though. You can ask him. And he points to Harry. <laughs> it's so yeah, it's good. Really good. And I and I am a little sad that with the whole movie of him being smug and useless, we don't get... It, it, it's the opposite problem to the G one. We get the payoff, but we didn't really get the build-up. With Gilderoy, we get all the build-up, but we don't really get a lot of the payoff. We get a tiny bit of it. Just a tiny bit. But it's not really what it... I, I can, Considering how much of an impactful character he is in this movie, I really would have liked to have seen more of that. Um, I, I Add an extra two minutes. Just just do that. Like, that's all I need. I don't need a lot. Just a little of him at the end. I know there's a post credit scene, but it's nothing. It's uh, it's nothing. It's just... It's oh, that was so... Because, you know, this was this was back in the day before they did post credit scenes a lot. Yeah. And I remember being so disappointed because everyone was like, you've got to wait. There's a there's a post credit scene and you're like oh my god what well, that's gonna be and then it's just like yeah just it, I mean like great, it's it's but... a, it's a tiny gag and it's fine I guess if those don't remember it's just Gilderoy Lockhart is like clearly like he's 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 now got a book out called like Who Am I or something um, and it's just yeah he just he's. He's looking confused and he's in a straight jacket and he's just looking around and his hair's all mussed up and yeah cool <laughs> that's great um, it's not quite what I was looking for and it's also not in the main text of the film so it's hard to yeah hard to be too excited for uh, it's a real shame that that's the but otherwise Gilderoy Lockhart is an absolute you know steals this film but also as you pointed out Radcliffe you know so much better. I, it's better. weird. Yeah. It's weird though, because I still feel like he's a little bit behind everyone else. Just every now and then with some line deliveries, but on the whole, he's he's really grown into it a lot. He he's definitely the biggest jump in acting performance, like, like ability between between these films. Like that's it's a huge leap from the first one uh, for him. And they so, shot them it's very, and they shot them so close together, like so close together. Um, well, did, right, did Dan, they? Because, because you... we? Like, my question here, Chris, is why? Have they, they're so much older. They look like what a jump in their f- f- physical appearance between movies. I like, think that's 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 the age, though, isn't it? But they did because I I remember seeing shots of the like car come out of like filming and set photos like around the time I saw the first movie. Yeah, 
Well, they shot them very so close they def- together. They did. Yeah. Um, right, Dan, are you ready for this? Yep, hit me. Right, Empire, Collider, Time, an article on BuzzFeed, Screen Rant, USA Today, and Movie Web all have Chamber of Secrets as the lowest ranked Harry Potter film. So some of them have, if they're doing wow. Beast, have Beast below them. But in terms of the Harry Potter films, wow. all of those articles have Chamber of Secrets last. They are all wrong. Because I'm yeah. also fairly confident as we go into this that I think at least the last couple of these are going to be lower. At, at least. I, my, if, if I was predicting now, my, my memory from the last rewatch was that I didn't particularly enjoy Goblet of Fire or, or didn't think... I think Goblet of Fire, my bigger shock was it wasn't as good as I remembered. And uh, Half-Blood Prince, I remember just being this dark, hard-to-see muddled mess so we shall we shall see when we when we uh yeah we we both had a lot of problems with the characterization towards the end of the movie and the way that they did certain events played out i I remember that but that's but we'll get there when we get there but yeah that's that's what weirdly this and and i'm trying to i'll I'll have another scan but if it's the length so let's talk about the length specifically because i the the few i looked at last night i know referenced length do you agree with me that actually you think it's paced quite nicely? Or do you think it is a bit long? So the statistic is interesting because... So let me pull it up because it was in my trivia, but it's it's, it's relevant. Um, where is it? Uh, one second. Okay, so this is based on the second shortest book, but it is the longest movie of the franchise. Ironically, That's... Order of the Phoenix which is the, the the longest book, is the second shortest of the movies. That's I quite think... funny. <laughs> but you, um, and I know we I know we're doing a lot of comparing to, you know, the other films in this in this series, but you can't, but that's irre- that, the fact that it's the longest film is is irrelevant to whether that's a criticism of the film. You can only no, criticize no. whether it's too long. No, no, agreed. And I think the thing no, that- no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm arguing with other people, not you. Yeah, yeah, no, and I and I, and I agree with that point. I think you're right. I think that I think the thing is, pacing and length are not the same thing, and there is a lot of like. I do think someone looks at a film and goes, okay, it's two hours and, you know, 40 odd minutes. My version was actually two hours and 50 odd minutes because it turns out I acquired some sort of extended edition because um, when I started going through the trivia, they were like, they cut out this scene. And I'm like, but that scene was in the movie. And it turns out it wasn't in the original movie. I saw an extended version. Um, so, sorry. If, oh, actually, I should, I should clarify this. If I reference a scene, Chris, that you didn't see, um, do let me know because it might be that I saw it because it's in this extended cut. <laughs> it's apparently oh, it's about there. 10 minutes longer. I had no idea. <laughs> Yeah, nice. I had no idea this existed. That's just the version I had. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I didn't know they'd done it's extended take... cuts of the Harry Potter movies. But like, so the, the version it... you watched is Harry go to Borgin and Burke's at all? Yeah, the bookshop. No, no, Borgin and Burke's in Diagon Alley. Not Diagon Alley, sorry, Nocturne Alley. Yeah, he, that's where he lands after the flu powder, and he looks around. He gets hands. He gets his hand caught in a hand, and all that stuff. And does Lucius and Draco both come in and they have a conversation with no, Borgin? L- no, Lucius didn't come in and have a conversation right. with Borgin. So, the, yeah, I, ha- I have some weird extended cut where, like, you know, Lucius comes in and he's he's got a bunch of stuff that he's selling because of the raids. Because that's... Well, we'll come to that. There's a, there's, a, there's a weird plot thread that's set up but not paid off and I don't know why. But, oh, no, I guess because it isn't set up because... It, oh, this is what's frustrating. So there are two plot threads that I was getting annoyed weren't being paid off and it's because i've got this extended cut where they've added in scenes that aren't there in the cut you will have seen so there's a setup for the premise of the reason lucius so in the book the reason lucius does this puts the book that's going to open the chamber of secrets into Ginny's cauldron is because he's trying to undermine arthur weasley's muggle protection act and the raids that Arthur Weasley's doing for the misuse of Muggle artifacts. So he's trying to make Arthur look stupid by having his daughter be caught opening the Chamber of Secrets. He's, mm. So he's trying to smear Arthur. That's the point. It's not really in the film, but the version I saw has at least a scene or two that set it up. He's talking to Borgin a lot about 
Weasley and his and his uh, and you know uh, and his his Muggle Protection Act and how much that will be a problem for him because he's selling a bunch. He's I mean he's being forced to sell a bunch of his you know the Muggle artifacts that he's got which that he shouldn't have to Borgin. So that's set up there. The other thing that's clearly um, cut from the movie, but I got the remnants of in my in the version I watched is Hagrid has a sequence where he meets Harry and he talks about all the roosters being murdered and that he's going to put up a fence around the rooster, the hen house because he's getting annoyed that the roosters keep getting killed. That's not in the, the final version of the movie because they don't pay it off because, in the again, in the book, in the book, um, the rooster's call kills a basilisk. So one of the first things they have Ginny do is murder Hogwarts' roosters, which is a very gruesome image. Because they have, like, they do a bit where Voldemort's mocking her and he's like, oh, I've got all red paint on me and I don't know where it's come from. You know, he's, like, mocking her what Ginny's been writing in the diary, um, which is really hard. Yeah, because like, I was to... going to say, because isn't that, isn't that the blood that she then uses to write the messages? Yes, exactly right. She then uses the rooster to write the messages, so it's, like, two, two for one. So, so it's, like, uh, so it's, it's yeah, it's, it, but there's the only remnant of that in the final cut of the movie is Hagrid running in, holding the rooster when he comes in to, to talk to, when he says, you know, he's going, Dumbledore, Harry couldn't have possibly done it, you know, and in that scene where he bursts in and then finds out that Dumbledore believes Harry and he just goes, all right, oh, well, I'll be outside, and he goes back out. He's holding a rooster in that scene, and that's in the movie, but every other reference to it has just been cut. <laughs> um, so, so apologies um, because this extended cut thing really threw me. Apparently, it's the only, the first two are the only two with extended cuts. So this can't happen again going forward. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so if I do reference anything else that's not in the movie, please let me know. <laughs> um, Will do. Yeah. So anyway, big questions, Chris. So uh, oh wait, well we we were in the middle of a point, were we not? When I got distracted by that that problem. Uh, yeah, just in general, and, and I've gone through basically all of them um, reference the the length of the film, and that that kind basically of yes, like. Me. So my point yeah. is, my point is, so it's a two hour and forty five minute movie. Pacing and length are not the same thing, and and I will say what happened. I think what's happened here is this was the book that was these two were the, the books that were short enough to potentially be adapted completely without huge omissions but to do that they needed to be reasonably long once you get to the next books that get longer it becomes entirely impossible to do the complete book so then you have to make cuts anyway so then you might as well start really you know taking a knife to it and that becomes the thing going forward you know um, mm-hmm. with all these movies and that's fine that's understandable that's what happens with adaptation especially once you get to sort of like gobbler and order which really do balloon in size um, so, but I so they, they had the opportunity here to pretty much get the entire book on film in two hours, well, two hours forty minutes, whatever it is. Um, and but because it's the whole book, very much, no, pretty much nothing omitted except for the, you know, some, uh, you know, they really shortened the first couple of chapters with him at the Dursleys. You you actually get a film that's really well paced because it's not. Mm. Moving too fast, it's not moving too slow. The story is developing at the rate it was designed to develop and the book side. And it never feels jarring, it never feels like it's jumping around. You get the sense of time passing in the school without it feeling like we're cutting through the year like in the first one. But the story is developing at a really nice pace. So, in terms of the pacing issues, I... I, I don't care that it's the longest one. At no point is it boring. At no point did it feel overlong. At no point was I checking my watch... It just played through. If if you'd have made me watch this movie without me being able to check the length, like if I couldn't, you know, pause it and see the timer that says how long is left in the movie, then I probably wouldn't have guessed it was as long as this because I think it works really yeah, well. I'd have probably agree. said just over two hours. You know, I wouldn't have guessed two hours, 40, 40 odd minutes, or in my case, two, two hours, 40, 50 odd minutes. But, um, you know, it's it's really not a problem in any way, shape or form. So I find it very strange. So many of them have, because I think length is an issue. If you're really padding it out, you've not got enough stuff to get to. So your movie is just constantly like got lots of scenes that don't need to be there. That are repeating points that have been made by other scenes. But this movie isn't doing any of that. Mm. It's not rushing through anything. It's not going everything too slowly. It's, this is a perfectly paced film. I I, I don't understand that criticism. It's, it's not, it's not reflective of my experience watching it. That's for sure. 
One uh, the, one of the only other criticisms I saw flicking through these these ranked articles is that Dobby's unlikable. Um, I I have a really interesting thing with Dobby in the in my head when I read the books. You know, sometimes if someone does a great, I can't remember who it is, but someone has a great stand up routine. Maybe it's Michael McIntyre about how when the films came out, everyone realised that Hermione wasn't called. Hermione, Hermione. <laughs> like, and he's like, he's like, Hermione's name is a name that when everyone read the books, they just gave up trying to work out how to say it. <laughs> so they just went, Hermione, <laughs> like, every time her name was there, Ron, Harry, and Hermione, <laughs> like, he does this quite good routine about it. But with, but you know, sometimes you, you miss a description or you miss a word and you picture something completely different to how it actually is. Right. I pictured I never pictured Dobby thin. In my head, Dobby Dobby was essentially most comparable in my head to a larger version of the of the aliens in the spacesuits in the Toy Story franchise. <laughs> you know, the toys from the grabber machine. Like basically Dobby was a a slightly bigger, maybe slightly more green, maybe a little bit thinner than that, but cert- but not not thin. Dobby was just a little thing bouncing around, like this little alien like thing. I don't know why. I think I do. I've always found why <laughs> because I've just pulled up the description. The the the, the Pro- little creature on the bed. So it is said little, giving that but indicating height. I feel had yeah. large bat like ears. And bulging green eyes the size of tennis balls. Yeah. So the, the, the large bat-like ears immediately conjures a large image, I think. And then the size of the eyes is pointed out. It doesn't describe yeah. him as being scrawny. Yeah, so I so that threw me when I saw the film, the promo material, and I'll be honest with you. Every time Dobby's appeared on screen, I'm like, that's not that's not Dobby in my head. Um, so that, but that's obviously incredibly personal um do you but i've i do find it hard to analyze dobby and get past it which is wrong but it's true right. do you how do you feel about dobby dan do you think dobby's annoying what because yeah, i think the the i think he's the multiple be, right? appearances yeah exactly and i think that you're meant to feel in the book it's just oh fucking hell we really jesus in in the book we you you are i remember being so frustrated by, with dobby and so irritated with dobby and, you know, a bit of that comes across here. Like, I just remember being like, leave him alone, like, when, when reading that book. So you you kind of want to feel irritated by Dobby. Um, yeah, because I think, because I think they... look, it, just, just basing it on what's in the film itself, Harry is irritated with Dobby. At first, Harry is respectful and nice to Dobby, but Dobby gets him a bunch of trouble at home. Then Dobby's attempts to, quote, unquote, save his life get more extreme and put him in more and more danger. The Whomping Willow nearly kills him. The Bludger nearly bloody kills him. It ends up taking out his arm and the rest of his bones are regrown. Like, this is all Dobby's fault. You're supposed to not like Dobby. That's that's the story. That's the point. Like, he, he's supposed to be this, you know, well-intentioned, but ultimately very inept in terms of his plans are insane. <laughs> You know, he's just not thinking straight, sort of like character that you're supposed to, by the end of the movie, when you realize what his situation is, you're supposed to suddenly feel sorry for this creature you've been irritated by the whole time. That's the point, right? That's the movie. Mm. Like, forgetting the, you know, glasses up nose in the book bit, the movie presents it that way. I I don't know how anyone wouldn't get that. I think it's really clear. Harry tries to be nice and friendly to him when he first meets him, but Dobby becomes very irritating very quickly, uh, gets him in a bunch of trouble, nearly gets him killed. Um, Again, good-intentioned, but you start to feel sort that they have a hint of why you feel sorry for him when he shows up in the hospital wing at the end when he talks about ironing his hands and even Harry softens to him at that moment, you know, realizing what he's going through. And then you get the end of the movie when you realize how bad it must be for him. And that he's been trying to help this whole time and he's, he's living with the Malfoys. That moment of Harry and the so is triumphant and it's triumphant in spite of, you know, Do- Dobby's presence in the in the rest of the film being deliberately sort of uh, causing more problems for the main character than not. Basically, yeah, I, d- I, I think that's I like, do... that's that's the story. I don't understand why that would be a criticism. It's it's a good story. It's, 
it's so much. I'm, I'm so sorry, guys. Because especially when Dan first said this, I was a little cocky and was like, in my head, I didn't say it out loud because I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. But I had this little cocky moment of, I, th- I think Dan was worse for that sort of in the book thing last time. And now I'm doing it quite a lot this time. But I do prefer the way that the sock thing is done in the book. Like the notion that Harry has the time, shoves the diary into the sock and Lucius just throws. It's much, I think it's much more in the, in the, like in the film, he gives him a book with a sock in. Like, whereas in the book, he gives him a sock, like inadvertently, accidentally. But I think that's done a lot smoother and better in the, in the book. Yeah, I'm okay with either. I, I get, I, I understand the criticism because, like, yeah, it's, it's the, 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 he has to be gifted clothes. Um, and for those who aren't clear on the difference, the, the specifically, I believe in the book, uh, he gives Lucius the the sock is in the book. Lucius sees it, pulls it out, and ugh, it's gross. Gets covered in mud and stuff from the chamber, and he sort of tosses it at Dobby, and then is like they're talking about the book, and Dobby has been directly given a sock. Whereas in the film, the choice they made was that I guess they they might have decided it was slightly unbelievable that he would open the book to see the sock. Because why does he open the book in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the book? Um, see the sock and then get it. So instead, they just had him hand think, the book th- off like casually. I think in the book, the diary is put in the sock. I think he has to take the sock off to get the diary out of it. I think. Do you think is that what he does? Should I, should I find it? That's if that's true. That's diff- that is different to even how I envisioned it. Let's see. Yeah, I, I think he shoves it. the diary in the sock. I think. I think and that's I think why he has to take the next sock time off. we do one of these, Chris. I'm gonna. I'm going to stop myself from having the book in arm's reach because we'll just keep doing this otherwise. Yeah. And this will take forever. Um, yeah, so let's, while I'm looking that up very quickly, um, I, yeah, I don't think Dobby's irritating. I, I, I think he serves a very... Inten- I, no, sorry. I do think he's, he's intentionally irritating. He serves a really important purpose. He's a really good plot point in this story. I think he's performed very well. I think the CGI on him is very good. I think when his little ears flap down, you do feel sorry for him and his big eyes go... You know, and he does the, the Puss in Boots look at the great. Uh, mwah. Chef's kiss. Go for it. Like, it's good stuff. I, I think Dobby's great in this. Um, w- let's, let's get to the big questions then, Chris. Does this work as a story on its own? So is this a natural, logical sequence of events without the need of the context that you get when you get a story that's in a larger form like a book? <laughs> I tried to... I thought you were going to... I thought you were going to try and avoid saying in the book by being like, when you get a story that's in a larger film, a larger form in in an alternative medium where perhaps mm-hmm. uh, more detail is able to be given. Um, yeah, well, if you were going to read this... <laughs> yeah. Um, <sighs> yes. I I think someone with no context from any other sources... Um, could follow the story and understand the beats well. Are there nuances that the films had to take out that adds texture and context to that? Yes. Are there nuances that the film has taken out that I think shouldn't have been taken out? Yes, i.e. the Ginny of it all. Like Ginny Ginny slowly getting obsessed um, and clearly being wrong. The whole kind of Ginny, Ginny and Percy have something going on. Uh, which is, you know, as simple as him kissing someone. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, so J, J, he had a he had a secret girlfriend who happened was in who was in Slytherin, no Ravenclaw, right? Penelope Clearwater. She's like a Ravenclaw, yeah. which is why he was sneaking around because they still there's a remnant of that in this movie. When Percy comes across Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle, they're like, "What are you doing down here?" <laughs> you know, and the, and the reason is mm. he's down there to see his girlfriend, but that's that's gone. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't th- I hadn't spotted that. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. The um, the and th- is a one second. Maybe she is a Slytherin. Is that not maybe part of it? Uh, carry on anyway. I'm gonna look I don't up. know. I can't remember. The sorry if you can hear that beeping. I basically before we yeah, started recording, that? my cat my cat was meowing and meowing meowing to get out the window, but he doesn't like to go out the window necessarily. He likes to just sit on the ledge of the window while it's open with the breeze and the ability to chase any birds that land nearby. And I knew opening the window was a risk and a truck just backed up and there was lots of beeping, so I'm sorry if you could hear that. <laughs> Carry on. Wish, at least you've got the option. I opened the window before we recorded the last one and I was like, have we got a pipe leaking? And next door I've got a water feature, which looks lovely, but it's just on. <laughs> like, And I was like, oh, 
Guess I'll be shutting the window then. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, fair play. Um, she's 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 a she's a, ra- she's a Ravenclaw. So okay, cool. What 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 about the diary? Oh, sorry. Yes, I've got that up. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, Harry grabbed the diary, dashed out the office. Blah, blah, blah. He could hear Dobby's squeals of pain. He took off one of his shoes, pulled off his slimy, filthy sock, stuffed the diary into it, ran down the dark yeah. corridor. Mr. Malfoy gasped, gasped uh, slid, skidding to a halt. I've got something for you. He forced the smelly sock into Lucius Malfoy's hand. Uh, what the Malfoy ripped off the sock uh, from the diary, threw it aside, and then looked furiously at the ruined from the ruined book to Harry. And that's when we get that you'll meet the same sticky end as your parents one of these days, Potter. He said softly. Oh, he said softly. So not with Potter as a delivery. Um, so there you go. That concludes also, this also- instance of in the book. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. No. And I, I think that's cleaner. I'd prefer that. Um, it's not. It's a nitpick. Like you know, it's not. It's yeah. not you know, breaking the movie. Um, but yeah. So back to the the chamber thing. So I think I think there is absolutely enough detail here to follow, understand, and get it. I think there are some bits like the Ginny stuff that have been missed, and and like the Hagrid stuff. I think in in other texts I've experienced this story in the the Jesus it's Christ. It's never. It's never. It's never um this film kind of the film kind of plays it as oh Hagrid might be the bad guy. <laughs> whereas whereas in other texts it's a bit more well no it can't be Hagrid, something's going on here, surely. Um and it's a bit clearer when we meet Aragon that like that's the creature and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I think there's details missed, but those details missed don't mean that someone with no other knowledge of the story wouldn't I, be able to follow the film. I, in my I honestly, I I think it's fine that um mm. that that they try to play it off as maybe Hagrid did it last time. You know, they get that information. It could be that they certainly want to. Because the thing is, you know, we've we've established Hagrid likes creatures, so it's it, it's not even that they're thinking he did it with the intention of hurting anyone. They're thinking he might have done it. Because he likes monstrous creatures and it all got a bit out of hand. You know, no one's thinking Hagrid was opening the chamber maliciously, even in this. But the assumption is that Hagrid might have done it last time. The creature, could he be involved again this time or at least know more about it? You know, um, so yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's how they fair. play it, and 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 I think that's I think that's fine. I think that works. I think it works for what we already know about Harry. They did include Norbert in the last movie, although I still think they shouldn't have. Um, I, you know, uh, so we've got the situation where that that works for the character and what we know about him already. Um, I, and I think going into the woods and meeting Aragog is. One of the one of the most fun sort of action sequences in the movie. There's a couple that this is that's one of the better ones, um, and I think, you know, structurally speaking, the going in there to try and get information and discovering that Hagrid had a separate creature and he was essentially framed is a reasonably good twist at that stage of the movie. You know, the thing we thought Hagrid had done was actually nothing to do with it. It was he was a victim of something else. And then it all sort of comes together, I think, at the end when we reveal that Riddle was actually the one opening the chamber and he used Hagrid as a sort of scapegoat. I kind of wish the movie had spelt that out a little bit better. Um, just had, you know, had Riddle say that, basically, in that in that kind of a phrasing, that sort of in a single sentence, you know, I... I, I I basically threw Hagrid to the wolves on that one. Like I, I was the one, I got him in trouble to save my own butt, basically. Um, just just because I think that would have been slightly um, helpful for a, a viewer without that context to be able to put it together. Um, mm. I think it's easier w- when you have read the book that part because it is just it's a smoother transition. So it's, I suppose it's more about exposition. Um, uh, that one than it is about actually what's in the film because I think the I think the the actual story of them thinking it might be Hagrid works fine for me um, especially because we 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 get it cl- cleared up reasonably quickly yeah, I, I will say it's a bit weird they they, t- they they discover the Hagrid stuff and then don't go and speak to him for ages it feels like in the film that was a bit of a strange it feels like there's a bit of a gap between Harry getting the diary entry and you know them being forced. To, to, which which is probably from the book, I, I can't remember, but it, you know, them being forced to go to see Hagrid as a last resort once Hermione um, has been petrified, which is again a really cool 
thing that from from the from the, from from both versions of the story, you know, Hermione's petrification is such a great catalyst for a sort of for the movie to ramp up, um, which is funny because you think yes, that yeah. all the other kids getting petrified would be <laughs> would be enough, but one of them's Colin Creevy and Harry hates him, so I think <laughs> I think on balance. <laughs> He that's that's an ex- you could you could take out that character. I know it's a bit of a fan. He's a bit of a fan favorite, and well, I suppose he gets petrified. Actually, doesn't he? So you you couldn't do that. Yeah, forget that. But he's not. Yeah, he's not it, got the because although because he's one but, of the only characters that would be looking at everything through like the lens of a camera. One of my favorite moments in the film. Actually, I scrap everything I just said about potentially removing the character because it's he's responsible for one of my favorite moments of the film. I love a little subtle moment that they don't need to put in, but just is is adds so much. Which is when I think it's Fil- Filch's cat is petrified, and they're all stood there. And Colin raises his camera and Percy just reaches out and just silently pulls That's the great. camera back down. That's I great. thought that was such a that was such a such a good piece of characterization for both Colin and Percy, neither of whom necessarily you'd expect to be given any characterization. <laughs> yes. Percy's given more characterization in that one moment than he is in the rest of the film. And Percy has a story um when you experience the this story through the page. Um, you know, Percy's got a lot more to do. Um, you do feel sorry sometimes, don't you, for some of these actors who must like experience the story through the page and go uh, and be like, "Oh God, oh man, I've whew, I've got some stuff to do in the next movie," and then like they get the script and they're like, "My bits have been cut from the next movie." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's you know, it's it's funny. I mean, it's it, it's it's. It makes sort of sense. Like, look, if you, if you were saying to me like, what can be cut, if you sat me down and yes, say what, uh, uh, what does yeah. go, you know, per- Percy's stuff is is probably the least relevant and, to anything. And let it's, me let let me clarify. Same here. The it's the Ginny connection to it is the reason I bring I brought it up earlier. Yeah, it's but that's what I'm talking. Yeah, that's the, what that's yeah, what I'm talking yeah. about. Though. So his plot is the catalyst for you know the uh, that extra Ginny stuff you're talking about because you know there's. The stuff, it's basically used as a way to ha- hand uh, hand wave away. So here's the problem. So you've got Ginny, and you don't want to give away that she's connected to the overall plot, right? But you also want the character development of Ginny having something she wants to talk about to someone because she, she, she knows it's going wrong. She knows that she needs to speak to someone, and she's not got the, the bravery. The way that they hand wave that away in the movie is... In, sorry, in the book, is that when Ginny tries to talk to Ron and Harry... Oh no! He tries to talk to Harry, maybe, and Hermione, and then Ron butts in and scares her off, or something like that. And mm-hmm. it, it, it's oh, she has. A, then Percy. Oh no! It's Percy that comes over and scares her off. And they're like, she was about to tell us something important, and Percy's like, oh no, 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 no! There's nothing to do with the chamber secret or anything. It's uh, she walked in on something with me. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's, it's to do with me. Don't worry. She's she's not got anything important to tell you. And it's the way that they can have the character development of Ginny go along without you suspecting it's connected to the Chamber of Secrets. That's the reason the per- the Percy plot exists purely for that moment, basically, <laughs> um, to to add a to add a, a, a you know a, a red herring to the to the to the to the story. But if you're going to play it differently, you're going to play it. We're not even going to check in on Ginny, so that it's then a surprise that she's involved. Then you don't need the red herring anymore. So so without- that's why Percy is kind of removed. I think. So remind me, I've got an example where I don't know if... I know why they did it, but I don't know if a change adds to the story. But we, we but let's get your view first on... Does does the Chamber of Secrets stuff function for you? In what sense? In the sense not... of do you need more? Do you need more? Oh, no, you, you have answered that, haven't you? You said you think it does work. Oh, no, that was about the Hagrid stuff. The question you asked me about... With this alone, with all the information you have in just the film, mm-hmm. does the Chamber of Secrets stuff flow? Do you get all the information? Oh, as a f- yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I yeah, I think so. I think that the the it's clunky in places, and I'm I'm really specifically just thinking of the info dump that we get from Tom Riddle. It's crazy. Mm. Like th- this is just the sort of writing that happens when you're trying to get information out quickly and you don't know how else to do it naturally. Tom Riddle. 
Harry walks in and he just immediately sputters out his entire plan. Like, it's there's no pr- provocation. Harry doesn't have to, like, you know, coax it out of him, taunt it out of him. He just immediately gushes his entire plan. And I don't know if that's, like... I guess the writers kind of hand-waved that away for themselves and just went, well, he's arrogant, isn't he? That Tom Riddle. Because he's the bad guy. So it's okay that he does this. But... As a movie, just from a story perspective, the bad guy just blurting out his entire plan top to bottom immediately the minute the, the hero shows up is weird. <laughs> it's never going to not be weird. Um, there was one of the moments as well I remember thinking, I'll see if you can remember it as we go on. There was, a, I think there's at least one of the moments where it was a bit, the information is correct and is given to us, but it's just given to us in a way that's a little bit forced. You know, there were just one or two moments like that. But in terms of actually whether the, 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 an audience could easily, find, I think yeah, perfectly. It's it's a it's a really clear A to B plot. Um, particularly the section I think that works the best is the section in the middle where everyone starts to think Harry is the one doing it, and they explain almost all of the weirdness of like you know they they cover why he can hear a voice. They cover the parcel talk thing. The dueling club scene does a real does a lot of work. Um, I take one thing ah. Oh, Mm, changes from the book let me tell you chef's kiss seeing the parcel tongue scene from not harry's perspective is yeah that's what i was gonna bring up brilliant Mm, because it it makes it so much more frightening and just makes narrative sense because you know whilst whilst when you experience the original version of the script in a 251 page story format (laughs) you everything is from I'm really enjoying you trying to find all the ways to say the sentence in the book. It's so good. (laughs) Doing that um, in the war joke in the last episode of Ernie Fools and Horses where he's like, if you say during the war one more time, and he's like, during the 1941 to 1940. (laughs) Um, But yeah, in in that original version of the script, which comes in a 251-page format um, where it's written as prose, everything is from... Harry's perspective. You have yes. a you 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 know, you know it's not it's not it's not told in the first person. But one of the most impressive things about the the series is, other than occasionally the first couple of chapters later on, we are and even then often we it's a dream of Harry's or something like that. Um, I think the the whole um, unforgivable bound unbreakable unbreakable bound thing unbreakable um, vow. From, yeah, I think only that from Half Blood Prince is like truly, completely disconnected from Harry's narrative. Um, it, well, you I know, think because towards, I got... think towards the end of the series, she does a couple of like you know opening chapters that aren't from Harry's perspective. I think. Yeah. So uh, she, yeah, but, uh, well, yeah, she, no, she, she does, takes yeah, advantage yeah. at the start of every book following. Yeah, like she the fourth, there's one where one? he talks to the prime minister where he has a chat with the prime minister yes. maybe in order of the phoenix and uh yeah so the, i think yeah i think I, I i think it is order of the oh no it's not order of the phoenix that's which book immediately follows order of the phoenix half blood prince but half blood prince does half blood prince have a bunch thing because half blood prince must be the unbreakable vow thing yeah it might well. be because because the, the the opening scene where fudge is coming in talking to the the, the sorry the quote-unquote other minister that's right after he's had to accept that Voldemort has returned. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So that must be hard that, so that's well. and that and that happens at the end of Phoenix. So yeah, you're right. They, they must, they, maybe they front loaded Phoenix with a couple of them. But there's also one sorry from uh, Half the Deathly Prince. Hallows as well. Whether at Spinner's End, the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the you know Snape's old house, where they're having a meeting about yeah. the, when Harry's being moved. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's a couple of them, I guess. Oh, no. the, Sp- the really clever Sp- sorry, thing about no, Sp- the gob- Sp- Spinner's End is 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 the vow the the um the scene where uh, they're talking about when Harry's being moved. I think that's supposed to be at the Malfoy Mansion. Right. Okay. Cool. The that would make sense because I think I think Draco's there. I might be wrong. Yes, he is. Yeah, he is. The- he's watching. He's watching the the Muggle Studies teacher rotate slowly in the center of the room like a ornament. <laughs> it's really yeah, grim. Yeah. It's a really dark scene. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember yeah. if the book. Oh, yeah, I don't that, remember. Yeah. The, I don't remember if the films cover that. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out if they do though, because that moment is really dark. No, I, the, <laughs> I I don't think the first film does cover that because it's not set in the woods. Um, the. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> which you almost <laughs> exclusively that film covers. Um, so the I can't remember what I was saying. Oh yeah, so because the whole thing is is from Harry's perspective at the very least. Um, it, you know, it makes sense to do that film, that's that scene that way in, in the uh, in in textual form. But the the fact that the film isn't doing that gives you the opportunity to go. Well, here's it from everyone else's perspective, which is a lot more frightening. It sets in a world where you don't necessarily have the time to do the nuance of other characters not liking him and being scared of him. You do it a bit in this scene. But having a scene that makes the viewer go, oh, that's a bit fucking weird. How come we can do that? Jeez. Like, especially well, it's when it's just... so different to how it was portrayed in the first film. Well, it's, it's, well it's, what's clever about it is, so in the, in, in the, in the book, um, the, the way it plays out is that Harry says to the snake, hey, leave him alone, you know, back off. And the snake backs off. And then later on, Ron and Hermione tell Harry how it seemed to everyone else that he was egging the snake on to attack Justin. And he's like, really? Because that's not what happened. The movie, because we don't hear what he's saying, really makes it look like he's egging it on to the point where you go, mate, back off. <laughs> why are you making the snake? And I know what's ca- I know why it looks like that because I've read the book, but even I'm going, Jesus, Harry, maybe <laughs> stop looking so sinister as you're talking to that snake, mate. <laughs> Because it really does look like you're sending it after him, <laughs> you know. Regardless, Snake, of your Alan intent. Alan R- Alan Rickman is so good in that scene as well. Oh his God. look of like his look of just what's going on here that you that were and and I think whilst it is universally praised, it's easy to underestimate Alan Rickman's performance as Snake as Snape in that scene where he's watching that take place. His performance plays as both a hero who has to protect Harry going, what? What's going on here? And a villain who's against Harry going, huh? Like it's, it's That's the, chest yeah, kiss. It's, it's yeah. Wonderful. His intrigue at what Harry has done and his shock and surprise and his, I might have underestimated you sort of look is so good. But on top of that, this, the, the dueling club scene, he gets to do both ends of that spectrum because he gets to do that really brilliant piece of sort of legitimate character acting at the end of that scene in his expression as him and Harry clock eyes. But at the beginning of that scene, Chris, he gets to be campy as shit. Um, uh, uh, and and really fun uh, uh, playing off Kenneth Branner when he d- asks Draco to come on the stage and he like does the weird hand gesture, you know, as he's doing it. Like Draco, come this way. And he's, it's like the campiest, hammiest shit I've ever seen, but I love it. Mm. So he gets to go from like you know Kenneth Branagh's level of just like over the top, hilarious, cheesy, fun acting to genuinely brilliant character acting and he gets to do it in the space of a whole just one sequence like one scene it's I, it, not only is it amazing that he can do it but it's so great that this script lets him do it lets him allows him to get to do both so close together it's, I, it, that's genius it's really well done because I, I don't recall that being as much of a moment um in the in the in the in the two hundred was it odd page script blah blah prose, um, you know it, it's 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 really well done. I and, it, and it's uh, credit to the credit to the both the the, the writers and and producers and you know production team and cast here because they they put that together so well. That whole dueling club sequence, top to bottom, is amazing. Uh, with one criticism, I'll come back to when it's what, but it's involved with one of my big questions. Um, so yeah, uh, really really well done. Yeah, um, no, it's it's uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Do what we move on to the next questions? big question? Yeah, yeah, do it now. Uh, enough school in this wizard school movie? Question mark. Is there enough school in this wizard school movie? So the last one we had a criticism um, that he doesn't actually attend classes very much. He's always in the school, but it's like they're walking down a corridor, they're at the great hall, they're in the grounds. Very rarely, actually, in lessons. Um, we can only think of like two examples. Now, this movie has a couple at the right up top, and I made note of it. Um, he's very he's clearly seen doing at least one Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson, one Transfiguration lesson where the story of the Chamber of Secrets gets done, which, by the way, is another great bit of uh, just sort of simpling, simplifying the story because it's they get it in History of Magic in the book through Professor Binns, but we've not been introduced to him, so have McGonagall tell the story. Perfect. Chef's kiss. 
great little way to save some time. Um, and then I think we have a Hubology lesson. But again, the Hubology lesson, like the Transfiguration one, is playing into the overarching story because it's the Mandrakes which are used to unpetrify people. Other than that, are they ever in lessons again? <laughs> is my question, Chris. No, but I do think if you're going to do school, that that notion of... Yeah, and yeah, it's the same complaint as last time. They could have set more scenes. Although in this in this film, a lot of scenes have to be set in the library because they're trying to research, etc. Um, I think it is the way to do it, to have them just be in the classroom but having the conversation. Um, I think because it's new lessons like Herbology, etc. Although I suppose it is a bit weird because some of the... I don't think we ever get a potion scene in this film. And obviously no. some of the, you know, we never see Madame Hooch again. Like, I don't think Flitwick's in this film, is he? Like, the Charles he's, Professor. And, uh, he's you know, on he the head table at the end during the celebrations, very clearly. He's, like, next right. to Dumbledore. He's, so he's, he's there, but we never see one of his lessons. We never see one of Snape's lessons. It just seems yeah. insane to me. I, I do have a question. I, so I, th- I, I, I get it. I get why there's the amount that there is. I, and I think, you know, it's, I'm, I'm fine with it. But there could always be more scenes where it's in the, in a classroom, not them walking between lessons or walking somewhere. Um, hmm. My lessons question is: it, Do they, you know, in the in the version that you can explore of this story, where the scene selections are chapters, <laughs> is you know the chapter version is. <laughs> Is the transfiguration getting more and more fraught? These I'm really I'm enjoying this on the grounds that I just think at a certain point, Chris, you're going to really struggle to keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when I have to think of it on the fly like that one. Um, the transfiguration lesson. Yes. Was that changing an animal into a cup? Because that's a bit fucked up. <laughs> like that's that's not cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess really, yeah. I, I don't. Mean, that is, I think that's directly from the book. I'm pretty sure. Um, I also don't like that one. Ron's got a rat in front of him because that implies it's scabbers, and I'm like, do the, does the logic of a transfigured animal getting transfigured into something else make sense? <laughs> like, um, I think I think they untransfigure them at the end of class. No, but even then, can you? Can you be transfigured twice without going back to your original form, Dan? Is my is my sort of well. So so uh, so in the in the in the lore of Harry Potter, um, they consider the tr- the animagi transformation to be a form of transfiguration. Like so, the anim- so being able to turn into a, a an animal at will is a version or a form of an- of of, uh, of transfiguration. It's taught in transfiguration class in a later book. So to get a bit technical on you, to be to have your physical body changed, one, I don't think those spells last forever by default. I don't think transfiguring is a permanent change. Uh, but two, when you're transfiguring something back to what it originally was, you're not changing it back. You're basically undoing your original spell. So my understanding is even if Ron cocks it up and the the mug has a rat's tail which is hilarious no no um, I'm, so i'm not I, i'm i'm not talking about the reversal i'm talking about to me you shouldn't be and i we can't we cannot do 10 minutes on this but i'm talking about for me you shouldn't be able to transfigure something that's already transfigured so he shouldn't be able to turn him into a cup because it doesn't because he's already transfigured no it's, it it's would a, make more it's not scabbers uh, yeah, that's what, but, but what I'm saying is by having him. That's what, oh, my point. Is I wish he didn't have a rat because you wouldn't go to. You see what you see, Ron with a rat. You think it's scabbers. Oh, I see. Well, they, I think they all so, have rats. No, so someone's got a toad. Oh, uh, okay. Because I was because I thought that I was like, oh well, maybe they're just using a bunch of rats then. But yeah, because that, that's just... that's my memory of it from the from from the from the the, the paper version of the story. No, the, the, the in the film originally, it, that you could originally buy in hardback and now get in paper. <laughs> because in the film, I think it's and I think it's never. I see if the scenes on YouTube. I don't have the. Um, I've I have it in front of me. Let me look. Up. In fact, oh wow, I'm actually I'm already. Sh- I'm already on that scene. That's hilarious. Cause... I'm pretty sure Neville has a toad, which is why your mind goes to in the film. Is this meant to be scabbers? <laughs> Let's have a look. Oh, the room is full of cages with animals. 
And she but it, turns, it, are those animals? Yeah, so the, what's in front? What's in front of Harry and what's in front of Hermione? Has a lizard. Uh, you can't see any animal in front of Harry. Uh, Ron obviously has a rat. Hermione has some sort of gecko. There seems to be an armadillo in front of this random Slytherin student. Oh, no, this isn't Slytherin student. This is a Hufflepuff. Sorry. Um, there's a Slytherin student in the background. I can't see what's on their desk. So yeah, they all have different animals by the look of it. Like so really for me, weird, if, if I'm quite right, oh, wait, weird on. animals though. Like there's an, oh yeah, there's an owl in front of one kid. Uh, so it's a frog in front of. Is that is that Seamus? Seamus. Or that's yeah, Seamus, Seamus, has, yeah. Seamus has a frog. Uh, right, yeah, so it's yeah, it's, 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 so it just I, seems to be random. And if you look around the room, obviously the room is surrounded by cages that are full of animals as well. So it, it, I think it's you know, it's just yeah, animal, it's not as bad animal now. of my, ever saw into cup. In my memory, Neville had the frog, and if Neville had the frog, I don't think. I don't think Ron should have a rat because it implies they're using their pets, but it's not Neville with the frog. It's Seamus. So Seamus. So yeah, no, it's, uh, it's not as much of an issue as I, uh, as I thought then. But I see what you're saying. If it is, if it is Scabbers, you shouldn't be able to sort of transfigure it, double transfigure a thing. Mm. I see what you're saying. And it is still cruel as well. Like it is a bit fucked. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. But I mean, but to be fair, to be, to be fair, I mean, that's inherited, it's a bit fucked is kind of like Hogwarts' secret motto, isn't it? Like, <laughs> Hogwarts yeah. is like this really messed up place where lots of really bizarre and cruel things happen on a daily basis. Like, like yeah. you know, in one of the later books, a kid gets shoved into a vanishing cabinet and is literally gone for like months and months. And like, everyone's just like, yeah, well, that kid kind of disappeared or whatever. Like, maybe we should look for him. Like, it's just kind of uh, part and parcel of living at Hogwarts, you know. <laughs> Here's one from this that's that's present in the film. Are they not calling the parents of Colin Creevely and Hermione Granger? Like, are they because you kind of go either there's two versions of that. Either Dumbledore and the team have gone. Let's all right. We, we've got the we've got the antidote coming up. Let's just leave it. And if they're not writing, then it's fine. Let's just let's just leave it for a bit. Or they phoned their parents and gone, your child's essentially in a in a in a coma, um, and their the parents have gone, oh, is there is there someone else there like holding their hand and shit? Yeah, there is. All right, fine. Like you know, let's know let's know when she's awake, like or he's awake, like. Yeah, I thought about. I've been thinking about that, but it's long term, isn't it? Though, so when Colin Creevy's first brought in, he's just been arrived, so there's no his parents wouldn't be there yet. That makes sense. My assumption is his parents showed up at a later point. And were there and spoke to Dumbledore because I'm pretty sure right. there's a fair amount of time is shown to have passed. And the same, I think the same goes for Hermione, right? Like, you know, she's petrified one day. A certain amount of time goes by. You might assume her parents have have come by because I know that in the in the, uh, uh, in, the in the in the book, the Weasleys are, are brought in when Ginny goes missing because I know Molly and Arthur appear at the school. Yeah, although there is obviously the question of whether whether they would be able to see the school. I assume if they were taken to the school, it would be fine. But oh, for the for the for, yes, well, yeah, I, they'd had to be brought, wouldn't they? That which which might be yeah. why it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, you know, I think you can explain that away. I think that's that's a that's a that's a you can fan explain that away in a way that's like makes sense. I because I, so mm. much time is passing around these things. Uh, you, it's just it's, just, it's the same reason you never see a character go to the toilet. It's off screen. It's happening between the scenes. Don't worry about it. Like it's one of the for me. It's one of those. My I would be, I, I would be mortified to think either of those options that Dumbledore was just like ah fuck it, let's not tell him. Or he told him and was like yeah, but you can't come and see him. Like <laughs> either one of those doesn't sit right but, with me. So. And also equally, like a film where. Like a film where like Dumbledore and uh, Dumbledore and Snape are walking down the corridor with urgency to go to the chamber to go to the hospital, and then uh, and then Dumbledore turns to Snape and says, oh, excuse, "Excuse me, Siverus, I'm just going for a piss." Like I'm, I'm bursting would immediately become the greatest Harry Potter film ever made. Yeah. Yeah, hundred um, uh, so percent. Here's a here's a little uh, here's a little uh, little a little tidbit, a little random thought, Dan, for the sake of putting it here. 
another moment in this movie I love, and I'll, I'll lead it to a question, so I'm. Uh, it makes sense. Um, I love the diagonally. <laughs> what did he say? Hmm, diagonally. <laughs> like I thought that was so funny. It's made me laugh every time. Um, I thought that was really good. Which brings me to my question, Dan. I feel like tonally, this movie's you know the same as the as the as the first in terms of that magic tone. I feel like the first was maybe a little funnier. I think it had more gags, um, more deliberate gags. Maybe what what are your thoughts on the humour used mm. in this film? So, so I, 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 I broke up slightly when you were speaking. You think this one has more humour than the first? Yes. No, I think the fir- I think this isn't as funny as the. I think the first has more humour. I think the I think the tone is the same, the lightness is the same, but joke really? for joke, I feel like there's more deliberate jokes in the first film. Oh, I disagree. I mean, all the That's... stuff with Errol, um, Cra- Malfoy mm. with Crabbe and Goyle. I didn't know you could read. Um, which, by the way, is a <laughs> is an ad lib. Apparently, um, apparently he forgot his actual line and just said that instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing um you know that, that ron and hermione handshake which we'll come back to um mm. you know uh the, the, the uh, well we, we have you know neville fainting in herbology although that bothers me because neville's supposed to be good at herbology but that's just uh yeah, in the book uh moment so we'll, we'll ignore that one because i think it works fine in this in this story um yeah that's an interesting thought but i don't know i i, I mean there's a lot of pretty deliberate humor in this. I mean, I mean, it is a darker film, I guess. There is a lot more I serious think, stuff happening. I think what, what so, it so, is. So, is I don't know, what, what do you think? The, where, I guess the, uh, losing the Dursleys, I guess, is a big loss of humor. Maybe that's part of it. Oh, I so loved how they did that, though, because I'm pretty sure that it, oh, I haven't got one. I'm pretty sure in the book, the cake crashes in the kitchen and makes a noise i might be wrong yeah yeah, yeah the, i think the you're way right. they do the way they do it in the film uh, to have the cake hover over to her head and have harry be trying to stop it but looking like he's doing it is brilliant i was so i was like that is a great ad uh, that is that is the bus in the third film you know getting thin and going in between buildings and other buses like that is such a brilliant addition that you go the book would be better if it had that moment play out like that in the in the in the book. Yeah. So, uh, brilliant ad- addition and like you say, very funny. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you know what it is. I think I think I noticed it more because I think I think the jokes are better in this film and they're done within the story. Whereas in the first film, it feels a bit more. This is a comedy moment, like the I look good, you know, tag and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It's. I think it's more natural, maybe, in this film. Uh, it's yeah. maybe more uh, my thinking. Yeah, because because the, the howler is very funny, and 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 I will say as well, credit to the because I don't uh, again. This is another one of those the movie added a thing that I don't think is in the book. I don't believe in the book. The howler like forms a mouth in the air and shouts it out. I don't. I could be wrong. I'm no, it's very good. Yeah. Um, if, the, if, if, I, if, assuming that's not in the book, what a genius inclusion! That's a really fun way to visualize it. Um, and it, yeah, brilliant. Like top, top, top tier. That's great. Creating a running theme, and this I think does p- p- come from the book. But that running theme of Molly Weasley yelling and being angry, pausing to say something nice to someone, and then continuing to yell yes, like yeah, that. Yeah. The whole um, your father's going to be so angry. Hello, Harry dear. It's not your fault. And then yeah, I and can't then, believe and, you did this. How Ginny dear, lovely that you made it to Gryffindor. <laughs> and then one of my favourite jokes in the whole movie, which is your your sons drove your car last night. Really? How did it go? I mean, that yeah. was very, very wrong, boys. You know, that's, I mean, Colin, that's such a good joke. Like, there's the movie's and again, packed with, And then we've not even gotten to Gilderoy. I mean, everything that man says is a joke. Like, it's, that he's like, like a walking comedy funny. machine. Like, yeah, no, I thought this movie is way funnier than the first one. And the more I think yeah, about no, it, the I more think, I think that's true. Um, I think you're right. The, the Can I just praise, that's a really good example. There's a moment in the first film where I think McConaughey takes away point and gives them detention. And like Emma Watson and Rupert Grint do this. <gasps> it's like they've been told, right, literally, uh, like have your mouth like wide open. And they do this kind of really thing. And Daniel Radcliffe has to say something 
and then reacts to like he says something and then goes <gasps> and like his mouth opens and it's just so like just not <laughs> great like but it, in this film when he does the how did it go thing Rupert Grint and Daniel Radcliffe's subtle enjoyment of that and s- subtle smirking but not wanting to overtly react because Molly will shout at them again it's the difference in acting in those small moments and in the mm-hmm. fir- how in the first film the reactions sometimes feel like acting whereas in this film the some of the reactions are a bit more subtle and smooth and the the acting's just that's an example for me of why how the acting's a lot stronger in this film it feels less i'm acting than it does in the first which is mm-hmm. another reason I, you know, it, it was among our reasons for personally both of us ranking uh, ranking this one higher. Yeah, and I think as well, like, I, I think this version of Molly is a bit softer than the book version. Um, mm. If, uh, But I think that's fine. I think it works really well for what this is. Because even when she's telling the boys off, you like, in in the book, it's very much like you get Molly going, like, you're in trouble and she's furious at you. Whereas in this, I think her fury comes across with maybe it's just because i'm reading it and i'm a, i'm in, I, i'm applying a tone to it um in the when it's the book and then in the film we've got a wonderful actress giving it more depth maybe that's that's just it um but it's uh, the, there's a warmth and a love uh, and a softness to her yelling that the books don't communicate in the books it's just when she's in that mode she's in that mode you know run mum's angry you know which is a, a perfectly adequate like perfectly fine and acceptable and, and, a, and a really good version of that character the idea that she can that she can be that angry when her sons put themselves at risk you know in that way um and it because you still know it's out of love but it's not coming through in the delivery the way it is here Whereas here, somehow she's injecting love and warmth into her angry anger, which is like, as as of just from a performance perspective, it's just like that's magic. Like that's so good. Um, and also, um, I forget the actor's name who plays um, Arthur Weasley, but again, he's just got that uh, brilliant sort of, I don't know, uh, sort of goofiness that that character really needs um and, 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 I, and i think it's a wonderful thing um there's a it's, line uh, chris mark mark williams is uh the actor's name yes who is also uh who, who chris and i also know from doctor who take a shot um so apparently and i didn't hear this but apparently there's even a really there's a bit when when he meets the grangers um uh, and i didn't catch it but apparently mm. he says i understand that other muggles are afraid of you yeah, he's talking to them in the background. It's so, yeah. it's so, funny. and that's obviously developing a sort of, uh, a sort of almost like a, it's almost like a running gag from the from the books. It's not really explained in the film, but he loves muggles, obviously, which they do cover. But the reason he thinks that other muggles are afraid of Hermione's parents is because they're dentists, and that's oh, yeah. such, that's a spe- that's such a specific joke that literally doesn't work if you haven't read the book. <laughs> I've just realised they they would be able to come to Hogwarts because they obviously they go to Diagon Alley. I've just realised because mm-hmm. they're there with them for that. So yeah. Um, so yeah. What are, what are some of your other observations well, points we've I, not I, covered, I, Daniel? I want I want to talk about the my, one of my final big questions, Chris. Mm. How is magic portrayed? Now, in the previous movie, I had some concerns in the well. For a start, Harry Potter doesn't cast a spell in the entire movie. <laughs> oh, I think we talked about. I think we talked about that. Not one, all movie. I don't, I don't think we did. I don't remember talking about that, but that's incredible. Not one. <laughs> um, not a single spell. Everyone does spells around him. All movie except him. Um, he never casts a spell, so he gets to cast a spell in this one. Um, now, there's a criticism we're going to come to of the later movies that I think yeah, the well, yeah, we'll I think there. the seeds yeah. of that criticism are set here, though. So, well, no. Let me. I've asked the question. Let me. You answer. I'm not going to answer the question. I've just asked you. So, why do you think magic is portrayed in this movie? Um. Yeah. It's, well, there's there's a lot of kind of flashing. I can't even remember. I, I feel like most of the spells are spells, which is a criticism of of later movies that we have. 
Um, you know, you think about the dueling club and it being the uh, the snake. You think about the eat slugs and it, it making the slugs appear. Like it feels like, and the 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 one of the most magical. When I, it, it it depends if you're specifically talking about spell casting, but one of the most magical, I think, right on the text things is the is the is the uh, Weasley's home. Like they can't ever give that much time to the burrow but some of those establishing shots of the knitting being done by itself and the um the washing up being done by itself are, are right on the book and right on point and create this real sense of a magical household i think the clock's a bit odd because clearly molly at least is also home at that point so why why are there only three hands moving to home um also but- also the clock has dentist on it which <laughs> it doesn't exist in the wizard world. That's why he's got questions about Hermione's dentists. parents being dentists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I it, it, did it feel as magical as the first film in that sense? No. Um, but I didn't notice anything specific in the way that I think you perhaps have um, lending to our criticisms of later films, which for those that don't, is essentially we'll get to it at the time, but for those confused... Um, we Dan and I both strongly feel that they reaches a point where basically the wands become guns. They're used as guns, not the attacks aren't creative, interesting spells. It's like literally bangs and and guns. So what's what do you think of the seeds of that in in this movie then? Uh, so um, I think yeah, I agree with you on the whole. I think magic in this movie, generally speaking, is used correctly to do interesting things. Things like the self knitting and you know uh, stuff like that, but there are two scenes that use things that I just go, hmm. Uh, the first is the dueling club scene, where three spells are used one after the other, all different that do exactly the same thing. Um, mm. uh, someone uses Expelliarmus, which in the book meh, is a disarming spell, knocks the wand out of your hand. Now in this, when Snape uses that on Lockhart. Uh, but just throws him to the floor. Blades a big blast that knocks him back. White sparks. Gilderoy knocked off his feet. Now, if you want to change what the spell does in the movie, I really don't care. Be consistent, though. Be consistent. Very important. Mm. So Expelliarmus just knocked Gilderoy Lockhart off his feet. Big sparks. Gilderoy falls over. Then Harry and Draco. Duel. And... Uh, Harry uses the Verte Stratum, which is a spell that's supposed to knock someone back from their feet. Looks exactly the same as Expelliarmus, behaves exactly the same as Expelliarmus. Then, oh no, I think Draco uses that one. He uses it on two. Then Harry responds with Rictum Sempra, which is a tickling charm in the books. Um, Draco doubles over in laughter. Um, that's what it's supposed to do. Cause your target to ta- cause your target to buckle with laughter. Do you want to have a guess what it does, Chris? Because uh, it is white sparks and knocks Drake off his feet. Um, mm. I, I until Draco uses Serpent Sortier, which is a spell that apparently just conjures a snake, <laughs> which is a very specific <laughs> spell. Fine, whatever. Yeah, the logistics of it of of which are really difficult in terms of Harry just, then speaking parcel tongue to it, and yeah. But, but then yeah, again, I suppose but, he speaks it to a tap later. So, but, it but, but yeah, but, but they've inherited that from the book. That's fine. I, I, I'm gonna we'll we'll, we'll skip. We'll, we, we'll, we can question that logic all day and all night, and we get into the whole debate. It's fine. That's whatever. Fine. Okay. If that's how it works, that's how it works. Okay. No worries. I'm gonna go with what the movie is telling me. But when the first three spells used in the duel, were all just different spells by verbal, by listening to what they're saying, that all did exactly the same thing, not exactly the most exciting duel, as it goes. And I think that really is starting to set the seeds for what becomes ones equal guns in later movies, where all the ones are just shooting sparks at each other and it's just dodging them. Instead of, you know, using magic, like if we're fighting and you shoot something at me, maybe I use magic to bend a tree so it blocks it, or you know, I use a uh, I don't know. So I or I use a spell to tie up your legs with vines, while you use a spell to I don't know launch something at me, or like I don't know, just do, doing different things with the spells that are more creative than just shooting sparks at each other. And I think that is a problem that these movies really, really have in, in serious issue. And, and I think this is the beginning. Um, and, and I was really surprised to see it creeping up so early in the franchise. 
Um, there is mm. another scene, uh, the scene where they're escaping the spiders, when Harry uses a spell, which is entirely invented for the for the movies, but again, I'm okay with that. It's Ir- Irania Ex- Exumai, uh, Exume, which is uh, a magical spider repellent sp- spell. I'm okay with the spell existing. I don't know why Harry knows it. They don't prepare <laughs> to go and fight that. a bunch of spiders. <laughs> I thought that. It's very weird and specific. <laughs> but again, also, visually, what it does is shoot white sparks. <laughs> so, I just... I also, had yeah. an, I also had an issue with logistics, because Hermione, unless I'm wrong, Hermione shouldn't be able to repair his glasses in Diagon Alley, because isn't that technically doing magic outside of school? Yes. Which yeah, he is. shouldn't be doing. Correct. Yeah. Right. Except for, I guess, if we're going by the... So, the magic outside of school thing is really dropped from the from the story here because... Um, so, the introduction to the film plays out differently to the introduction of the book. And I think, it's a, I, don't, I think it's a perfectly fine change. But the angle in the book is that the Dursleys believe Harry can do magic and are scared of yeah. him. And yeah. after the incident with the pudding... They get the Hogwarts letter that says, hey, you've done some magic. You're not allowed to do that. If it happens again, you'll be expelled. And at that point, Vernon goes, ah, if I lock you up, you can't use magic to escape. Because they'll expel you anyway, which is what I want. And Vernon locks Harry up. Now, I think it's perfectly reasonable to play it out the way it plays out in the film, where you cut that thread completely, because it is a lot to explain. And the premise basically becomes... You're a menace with your magic. I'm locking you up because I'm sick of it. And I don't want you going back to the school. That works perfectly fine. Makes perfect sense. There's a very logical through line for it. But it does not cover a thing that then becomes relevant in a later movie. Because in a later movie, one of the plot lines is about him doing magic outside of school. Um, But in the books, the explanation that would cover what happens with Hermione and her uh, repairing of Harry's glasses is they tell they can tell where magic is happening, but they cannot always tell who the conjurer is, which is why Dobby's pudding spell gets blamed on Harry. If she's in Diagon uh, Alley... Yeah, they'll think it's a um, another witch it, or... Well, it could be anyone. There's probably thousands of spells happening all the time in Diagon Alley. So I guess they wouldn't know Hermione did that, even though she's technically not allowed to do it. So yes, yeah. so uh, I, so speak, you can so you can fansplain that one away, um, less so the pudding one. But there you go. Speaking of Hermione and and magic, I, I so the uh, what and one I completely uh, agree and see your point about the the beginnings of that uh, magic being used like guns criticism, and I think you're mm-hmm. right. It does, especially the the sparks on Draco things shows that it it, it is it is appearing here for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Another magical moment of the film, one of my favourites, is Hagrid talking to Hermione and saying, you're comforting her after the, the mud blood thing. Um, oh, you've, co- thought you've, that was... you've come on to my last big question, Chris. Oh, nice. What's your, what's your last big question? Well, my last big question is, how do you think they handle introducing wizard racism? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that well, that uh, the, the best moment is is Hagrid comforting Hermione. Beautiful, right. beautifully done, beautifully acted on both Robbie Coltrane and Emma Watson's part. Um, very emotional, very sweet. Gets across, you know, the 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 lovely uh, view of it. Um, I think they, I think they do. They, they, I think there's less. There's maybe less rate, but I, you know what? I think that's the right decision. The you know I'd almost expect maybe Hagrid to be like, "I'm going to tell Dumbledore." Da, 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 da. But actually, the, the 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 approach they do in the Hagrid scene works so beautifully for the scene, so I don't I don't mind that so much. And actually, you see Ron's rage and stuff, um, and it's set up quite you know with McGonagall talking about how um, Slivering had the wrong view of of um, you know pure blood. I almost find it uncomfortable that she uses 
the the term pure blood because I mean it's kind of doing the same thing as the word mud blood, so it should surely be just as kind of um, right. criticized as a as a term. So I felt a bit uncomfortable yeah. with her using that in a lesson. Do, do you um, think but that Draco does over... it with that? Do you think she does it with a tone though that's kind of like you know quote unquote pure blood? Like you know I'm not agreeing with them. I'm using their phrase like sort of. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Um, but Draco looking over at Hermione in that scene and Hermione sort of scowling back. Again, some really good subtle mm-hmm. acting from Tom Felton and Emma Watson. The I think they do yeah, I think they do definitely it's it's <laughs> it's very clear what what's happening and uh, you know, certain parallels being drawn um with the with you know, the non fictional world and stuff. Um I think yeah, I think it's uh yeah. I would say it's uh, it's it's done well. You? Yeah, I, I think mostly that's that's yes. I think it's done well. I do have some. Can, I I wish they'd left the Muggle Protection Act stuff in. Basically, is 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 one of my two sort of points on this. Um, it, it's hinted at in the extended version that I've got, but I believe it's completely removed in the um, the final film, uh, the finished sort of the, the, the the finished normal theatrical cut of the movie. I think that's a, I. I think the movie would be improved by it. I, I. I don't see why we couldn't have had them at the breakfast table at the borough, throwing a line or two about how he's been working very hard because they're putting in a new Muggle Protection Act, and then have Lucius make a comment in the middle of the movie. You know, or or when they're at. Um, I always forget what the uh, what the the bookshop is called. Uh, Quillen, Flourish, Flourish and Blots, Flourish and Blots. Flourish and Blots. So, yeah, yeah. So when they're at, when they're at Flourish and Blots, um, you know, he you he, he could make a when he meets Arthur there, he could quite easily be like, um, you know, I see your Muggle Protection Act is coming through. He goes, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't expect your your sort would like that. You know, that, you know, just anything like that. I, I, obviously, much better. But like th- that, th- an exchange of that intent, and then at the end. You just have so this is we're adding, we're talking about adding three lines basically one in the burrow that that's what he's working on one when they meet at Flourish and Blots and then a final line at the end of the movie where Dumbledore or Harry imply that's why he was he gave the book to Ginny. I think it is referenced in the burrow. I think I might be wrong. But I feel like it comes up in the borrow. Yes, it I, I, still needs add, adding elsewhere. But I, I, think I, 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 I think it's I think his job and his doing raids is mentioned in the borrow. You know, raids yes, for yeah, yeah. magical items. But I don't think specifically this Muggle Protection Act is. And uh, yeah, that's and I and I and I think I just think if you're gonna if you're gonna make this movie have a theme of that running through it because the villain is essentially attacking people of a different magical heritage. You know, their, their parents are, are, are muggle, they're muggle-born, so their parents are muggles. If that's the route you're going down, this is the movie to do that stuff. Because the next yeah, movie's not yeah, really sure. going to be about that, and you're not going to get a chance to explore that stuff again. So I just feel like, it one, it gives Malfoy a lot cleaner of a motive to do what he did. Um, Lucius Malfoy, that is. But two, I just think, like, it helps enforce those themes and it can be, it would be added without having to add any extra scenes. You've got scenes where it can be discussed. You just need to add a couple extra lines of dialogue to each one. And I don't think it would, I think it would add less than, less than a minute to the movie. And I, and I, yeah, and I think it would, I would drastically improve that for me. The other moment that I think the movie lets itself down is when Draco uses the word mud blood. The reaction is from Ron and Ron alone. Yeah. I'm sorry, but the Gryffindors present should all be like, whoa, you know, I want to see people reacting the way somebody would react if somebody threw the equivalent real world slur out there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like outrage, disgust, uh, uh, you know, just all the different kinds of reactions you would get from that. The problem is, I guess, on a set like that, how do you explain how children should react <laughs> to those children? You know when people use the other word, kids. <laughs> well, just get just get them just just do the do the classic philosopher's stone mouth ajar stuff. Even that would fine, do, you know. 
I just I think there should be audible gasps, reactions. We don't get a proper reaction other than Ron's, which is delayed even in that scene. Ron doesn't react immediately. I they, they, I want to hear gasping the second the word falls off his tongue. Nothing. Mm. Silence for about eight seconds before Ron does something and no one else reacts. The reaction we do get and the performance we do get in the scene in Hagrid's hut is wonderful. Genuinely wonderful. Um, Emma Watson, glassy-eyed, just mm. feeling inferior, and then Hagrid comforting her, and the, you know there ain't a spell our Hermione can't do or whatever, you know all that stuff. Wonderful, brilliant, ah, oh, so good. Mm, chef's kiss again, love it, excellent. Yeah, You're winning. Brilliant. But the, the scene I've... before lets itself down because I think that scene is more powerful with a reaction in the scene prior to it. And so, while I think the movie definitely does do the thing it's supposed to do in terms of it is including all the wizard racism stuff and I'm glad that that stuff's there I'm very disappointed um, that we don't get more of a reaction in the, when, the, when the word is first uttered so we truly understand that it is essentially a slur and I, I wish we'd had the muggle protection stuff in because I do think that makes more sense of Malfoy's motives and it ties in really nicely with the themes like it's, it's one of the things that's so good about that book actually is that the, the villain motives like sink so nicely and while the reveal at the end which i guess we'll talk about of of tom riddle being voldemort is almost a bit disappointing because i almost like you know we just did voldemort like one book ago does harry need to meet him again in another form i don't know maybe why the third one is so good uh, i was gonna say that's why that's why book wise i'll tell you now but and you know little tease for next week book wise my favorite Mm. book in this series has never changed and it's it's prisoner of azkaban and one Mm. of the reasons is it's not it's not voldemort at all yeah, and I and for me, it's, it's just, I've always it it's been a toss. For me, book wise, it's always been a toss up between Azkaban and Order. So, because I, I think Order is a, a masterpiece for different reasons. But yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about it when we get there. But um, so um, yeah, so both, a long answer to to, to my fans. to my question. I, I think they handle it, but they don't handle it as well as they maybe could have. Here's a question for you, Dan. Um, Polyjuice potion, potion. Now is. The complete one. I think this movie suffers as slightly because it that is one moment that feels like, and I, my memory is will certainly get to it on some of the later films. Um, you know, the Harry Potter films can be guilty of taking this big kind of concept um, from the the version that's on paper and all subtitles, and basically reducing them down because they have to. That it's it's a bit too condensed now. The so I think the film absolutely loses, but I understand why that sense of how difficult it is to make polyjuice potion, how often they're having to go to the toilets to make it, how frustrated they get by Myrtle, etc. Now, but I understand that I get the reasoning for that. Is the explanation and the the reason for why they're even doing it? Do you think it's actually that thin in the book? <laughs> As well as the, does that come from? Because it is just like, oh well, let's ask them. I know what we we'll do. We will go to all this effort to do Polyjuice Potion. Do you think it's that thin in the book, or do you no. think it just ha- right? Because I can't really remember. So, what's your what's your view on the Polyjuice Potion of it all? Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's basically the, the 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 there's one moment that establishes why they're doing it. What like almost like one sentence. That if you happen to miss, or you're not like, like really hanging every single word that's uttered in that sentence, you'll spend half of the movie going, "Why are they doing this again?" <laughs> it's 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 not re-established as regularly as it should be, or discussed as often as it should be. I think you need a couple of moments where they talk about the plan and explain what the plan is, just so that the audience, because if you're gonna if you're gonna set it up, and then pay it off later it's different if you set it up and then pay it off immediately if polyjuice potion could be created immediately which to be honest with you might have actually been the move just to make the film a little bit tighter like oh not even tighter but cleaner i think you don't have to it doesn't have to be I, I, this is what this is one of those moments where people are going to realize i genuinely don't mind changes to the law and the world I, I as long as it's consistent in the films i i really don't care if you just go in and, the films and make sense for the school for the films i'll forgive i'll forgive it it, it it, it, it's yeah, it has to, yeah, it has to be done for a yeah. reason. It can't just be arbitrary, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah change yeah. for change's sake. Yeah, but like, if you just say to me, "Oh, Polyjuice Potion just takes like a day to make in the movies," 
fine. I don't care. What? Yeah, all right. If that's quicker and it makes the story more streamlined, because wouldn't it be better if they don't mention Polyjuice Potion six scenes, ten scenes before, forget about it, and then we come back to it and go, oh, yeah, they're doing that. That was their plan. Yeah. And what was it again? I think they were going to become someone. Like, forgetting... You, you, instead, you just don't mention Polyjuice Potion. You have them keep going, I bet it's Malfoy. I bet it's Malfoy. And then eventually, it's Christmas, and the school is half empty, but Malfoy's around, and, and Hermione's like, you know what, we could try. And then they just go get... They get the book. They get mostly potenty potions, which, by the way, 10 points film. You got the name of the book correct. I appreciate that. Small details. They matter to nerds like me. Um, they, uh, they, you know, they get the formula. They make the apologies potion there and basically then. And the sequence plays out from deciding to do it and enacting the plan basically across the same day. I think that's fine. Then it becomes a sequence. Like deciding to follow the spiders, getting them into the trouble in the... In the sorry, in the dark forest in the forest because um, then it's just it flows better right because otherwise what you've done is to try and be honest to the book what they've done is they've had them say earlier in the movie what their plan is and then there's this huge gap between them, that and them enacting it and you almost forget they were doing that you know it's, it's so it, yeah, yeah. I, I, it would work so much better to just go you know what in the films it works differently and you can make polyjuice potion what? in a day and to be honest with you I actually prefer that because then it makes more sense that uh, Mad Eye is just constantly swinging Polyjuice throughout the entire f- for, uh, fourth year. Yes, yes and I year. think you you could do all the moaning Myrtle stuff in a scene as well. You can set her up yes. enough, well enough in that yeah, in that yeah. scene. So um, there you go. Here's a here's another question. Um, I, and I I is think it, it's is wonderful. it did, did Ron's voice break between movies? Yes, yes, it did. <laughs> no, not not necessarily <laughs> that. The but yes, it did. Uh, the car stuff. I think every scene with the car is pure childhood fantasy film magic. Ah, I think yeah. it's I think it's wonderful. The the first scene where they escape with the car is exciting, intense, and I kind of like that he. I, at first, I was like, mm, but I actually kind of like that he doesn't forget Hedwig in this. <laughs> Whereas in the book, he forgets Hedwig and has to go back, and that's sort of what wakes them and stuff. I like. I think it makes sense a for him to remember Hedwig. And be for it to be the bars flying off of the building that is the thing that wakes them up um so i just think there's a real joy in that and then equally um you know following the train the notion of the train being behind the car is exciting and when the car does its hero moment in the forest um really really nice i think they should have then kept that going the notion of the car doing the work in the forest um, that would have been better and smoother, made made more sense. But in general, anything with the car is a is an absolute joy. I, did, I think. What uh, do, did, do you agree? A little. Did you know, Chris? Did you know that J.K. originally planned in the final book to have Ron out in the grounds fighting Death Eaters during the Battle of Hogwarts, and then the car to suddenly jump out of the forest and knock them over. She didn't get to put it in, and I'm sad because that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> I would have enjoyed that scene. She she toyed with that idea and then decided it was too silly for such a serious book. But I I love that idea. <laughs> if I'm being honest, um, I agree with you. I think it gives us action beats that aren't in the book because the book is all these books pretty much, um, with the exception of the last couple, are pretty actionless until their final acts. Generally speaking, they're not action books, are they? There's not lots of sequences of them running around. She finds ways to inject action in them through Quidditch or through the Triwizard Tournament or through other means during the other books. But generally speaking, that the action is usually sort of secluded to the last chapters of the book uh, uh, in a in a, a tip typical harry potter adventure so taking the car and using it as a good excuse to get some action in um is brilliant i think it's a great way to do it um they, they you know uh, you know in, in the in the book it's 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 a it's a simple scene of they follow the train there are some tribulations in that they lose the train at one point because they go above the cloud cover or whatever and they have to find it again but it's nothing like this where they basically head down to the track to try and find the train discover it's behind them lose control of the car it's all flipping around the bridge and stuff great wonderful uh, yeah, ten points. Like, what a what a what a perfect choice of a moment to turn into a bit of an action adventure beat for the movie. Um, same with the, the the stuff in the forest. My only small criticism is I don't really think you need the shot of the car before they find the spiders, where Ron goes. Oh, it's mm. living in the forest because don't remind me the car is there right before you meet the spiders. Have the, yeah, the car appearing be a hero moment, right? Like, I want I want to be... Ple- I'm never going to be surprised by it. I've read the book a thousand times. But most audience members won't necessarily know that's coming. And I think that's 
I think the surprise of them running away from the spiders and then the car just turning up is too good to spoil with that random shot where they're walking through the dark, dark forest and, um, and they see the car and they're just like, that's the car. Oh, it seems to have gone wild out here. It's just, just a part of the forest. Now. And it's like, no, 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 no. Bad, bad Ron and Harry. Bad movie. <laughs> Stop it. Um, it's such know, a shame because but- it, it, it going off into the forest in the beginning is enough. Like, yeah, like, and, it's, and also that's one of my favorite jokes from the movie as well. And I don't know if it's in the book; I can't remember. But the, the car just ejects their bags and them. That's brilliant. Like, you don't need to have a setup shot after that because that's such a good moment when it gets out of the Whomping Willow situation and it just launches them from the car. It's great. So yeah, the, um, is uh, right. Let's do it, Dan. Let's let's get to the Ron and the Hermione of it all. Because on the one hand, I, whilst it's awkward, although I don't think as awkward as and my friend Tom, just I remember vividly, and every time I watch this movie, I send I send him this moment. Um, the he I remember I hadn't seen the film yet, and he, you know, at twelve years old, I remember vividly him going, "Mate, there's a moment in this film that made me laugh so much," and I was like, "What was that?" Because we were gangsters at eleven years old. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he was like, there's a moment at the end where Hermione comes in and Ron sort of flits to the flits out from the from the row. And then Harry goes behind him, behind him and is like, whoop. Like, <laughs> so that moment always makes me laugh and smile. Um, I think it works fine. It just it reminds me of my friend, uh, Tom, that really just makes me laugh. But the embedding the Ron and Hermione stuff um in this film, I think is a really interesting choice because, you know, they, they talked about that. I remember behind the scenes stuff going, there are things embedded in this film that we're starting to embed earlier than the books. I don't think that's true. If you actually look back at the chamber of secrets, uh, the, the book and look at, and I can't think of any more, so I'm just going to call it the book and look at Ron's reaction to Hermione being petrified look at Ron's reaction to Hermione being called a mudblood like the they she was sowing the seeds already like Harry is saying stuff Ron is just sat looking at her terrified when she's in hospital so i i think actually the the book was embedding it as well it's just way more subtle than the film does but you know what? I think I think you, you know you know at that point that's probably where that story's going. Yeah, start start embedding it in because actually, you as a ch- what's really nice about that moment at the end, I think the handshake is one. It's also funny, but two, as an adult, you watch that and go, they're afraid of each other because they fancy each other. They have feelings for each other. As a child, you watch it and go. Oh, uh, Harry, Harry and Hermione. Uh, sorry, Hermione and Ron don't really like each other. Like, they're, they're, that's a bit weird. Like, I don't think you understand it, and I think that's great. Like uh, this, this kind of theme of feelings and and romance uh, that you know potentially it, uh, uh, almost an adult theme in a child's book playing two different ways to to an adult and a child. I think is quite clever. Um, so I I don't object to them introducing that earlier in the films than is than is introduced in the uh, in the books. What's what's your feelings, Dan Daniel, on the Ron and Hermione of it all? Um, I really like it. I think it works brilliantly. It ends up playing into what we already know where it already goes. Um, it's actually an accident. Um, that that's how it worked out. Um, apparently, the script had her hugging really? both. Um, and 11-year-old Emma Watson was really embarrassed about having to hug the boys in front of the entire cast, and the compromise that Chris Columbus gave was that she'd only have to hug one of them, and then they'd do a joke, and then even when she hugged Harry, apparently she let him go really quickly every time, and they had to cheat with the footage, where they take the few seconds of footage that they had, like barely a second that she actually held him before she let go immediately, because she was really didn't want to do it. Um, they... Um, sort of looped that footage from different angles. So when you see her face wow. and then you see Harry's face, um, it's actually the exact same moment played a couple different ways, played a different couple of different angles to create, make the impression that the hug lasted longer than a split second. And then obviously the compromise was that instead of hugging Ron, they get embarrassed and shake hands. Um, Watson also said in a recent interview, um, 
Oh no, that's the that's a little bit that's a, that's not so that's the same thing. Um, so yeah, it was had the, so Watson's impression of it is that they 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 that they actually had to freeze the footage to make the hug with Harry look longer. I've looked into it. It's not what that she's right that they did use editing to make the hug look longer, but it's not freezing. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's absolutely it's, it's it's absolutely a coincidence uh, wow. that it plays that way. Um, I was very surprised to read that also, um, but yeah, there you go. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, no, I had no, I, I did not realize that at all. Wow, mm-hmm. fair play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it works but out. It, but it plays, it, it plays so beautifully. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. So there you yeah. go. Uh, but I, I, I think, it, I, I think in terms of look, sometimes happy accidents, right? Like it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a wonderful moment. It perfectly sets up what where we go with them. At this point, I think the Goblet of Fire book was out which is the book that first really heavily hints at Ron and Hermione because he gets jealous with the crumb stuff. So for me, they, 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 they're pro- it's, yes, it's sort of an accident, but there's no way that Columbus wasn't going, well, if she at least hugs Harry and then gets awkward with Ron, what kind of maybe, cl-? you know what I mean? I still think there may have been some intent, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, a bit of an accident, but yeah, one of those things. Wow. Um, I have a couple of other random notes to go through, if that's okay, before we get into yeah, the triv, Chris. Uh, or into general thoughts and the triv. Well, we'll do the triv and then we'll do general overall thoughts. Um, I love that Percy's basically got brown hair in these movies and no one ever says anything. Who has Molly been seeing on the side? We'll never know. Um, just that was funny. Um, I don't know why when Harry says diagonally wrong, they don't do the thing that happened in the book where he like in accidentally breathes in some soot first and that's why he sort of like coughs it out wrong um instead they just make him look incompetent strange choice but fine and specifically incompetent because also in the book they play up his nervousness which they don't do here yeah, so, so he, he just he literally just looks, just like an looks idiot. <laughs> yeah he literally just looks incompetent yeah um the scene that's deleted from the theatrical cut but is in the movie with borgin of borgin and burks has a really funny moment in it that i wanted to give credit to where Mal- he gives malfoy a pi- uh, Dr- lucius malfoy a pile-, a pile of coins to pay for the things that he's trading and then when malfoy turns his back to talk to draco he takes one of them back it's really fun very subtle and nicely done i just really enjoyed that <laughs> he just sneaks one of the coins back into his own hand it's great um what, what, Nocturne Alley. I've got a note here about Hagrid showing up. It's so random. He's like, "Ah, oh, there you are, Harry. Here you are. There's Hermione. Right. I'll be leaving you two off to it. Bye." <laughs> he just leaves, and it's so strange. <laughs> in the book, he's just like, it's, it makes sense. He's there for a couple of scenes. In the, in the film, it's just like, why is Hagrid there? It's like he shows up, and then immediately he's like, "Bye." <laughs> I don't know. There's a few scenes like that with Hagrid in this movie. Uh, uh, yeah, it plays weird. Plays weird. Um, I wish we'd met Har- uh, uh, more, spent more time with Hermione's parents, uh, but just that's a note I put down. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. I, I just wanted to, yeah. I think I want that from the books too, though. So uh, We talked about the... Uh, oh, right. The, we almost get tr- killed by a tree line. Um, so they talk about... Uh, you know, all the different b- things that have befallen Harry. And then he, they add, we almost get killed by a tree. Clearly someone doesn't want me here. Which kind of, as a sentence, implies the tree was bewitched to get him. But obviously the Whomping Willow behaves oh, that yeah. way for a reason. And is the is, is key to the next story, which was out by the time this was made. And also, a few minutes later, Snape says it's... It names it the Whomping Willow and says it's been there for years. So I don't know why that line is there. It's very strange. It doesn't make sense. Sorry. Um, there you go. I um, guess it's just a bit... It's an excuse to build in the idea to the audience that this is all being orchestrated in some way. Yeah. Yeah, I get, yeah but not the Whomping Willow part. The, the no, I know, but closed, it's still... It, the, the, all the other stuff, fine. But the Whomping Willow thing, weird. But, no, but the but the characters don't know it's not, and it, it is an excuse to get the idea in the film. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I'm just giving a, I'm you know I'm playing devil's advocate, I'm giving a defence. Yeah, Why? but what what my I suppose what my point is, they already do that with the other stuff. There's no need to also do it. That you you getting that into the movie by saying the barrier closed. Someone really doesn't want me here. You know, you don't have to add the tree thing because you're saying that anyway so it's it's yeah it's i just i don't really see any reason why it's in the movie even with the devil's advocate thing i just don't think it makes sense to put it in the movie because you're already achieving that with the with the previous line so yeah but anyway uh um sorry we should call this section dan 
has his weird nerdy book nitpicks but um i really hated the quick spell letter moment it's horrible and unnatural and shoehorned in it's dreadful it's one of the worst moments in the entire movie it doesn't make any sense the performances are bad the choices are weird the camera choice is weird the choice of filch just to stand there stiffly and not notice that the letter is just on the floor is weird harry being the only one to see it and pick it up is weird the pause between reactions is odd it's horrible it's delete it from the movie it's just fucking dreadful sorry (laughs) Which moment are you talking about? The, le- There's a, the letter the, moment? Yeah, the, oh, oh, unless this is a fucking thing that was deleted. Well, no, what was... Oh, one sec. Ex- Hello. What do you... No idea? Oh, it's you letting the cat in. Okay. Go on. Letter from who? The quick spell letter for... For Filch. Yeah, I don't think that's in the movie, in the... In the... Right, okay. Extended. Then my complaint is irre- irrelevant. Um, but basically, there's, this, there's a moment when they're leaving Dumbledore's office where Harry spots the quick spell letter on the floor at Filch's feet, picks it up, and it's the it's it's the it's again it's another hint at a story that's not really in the movie, which is the idea that the reason Filch was attacked is because he is a squib, which basically is like a magical person. He's like the reverse of a mudblood. He's like a magical person with no magical ability. Um, uh, so it, yeah, it, I don't. It, yeah, I don't remember seeing that yesterday. Okay, so I all right. Think, so uh, you know what? It's awkward and weird and bad, and it's not in the movie. So that's good. They did delete it from the movie, and that's the right choice. Why they put it back in, and even in the extended cut, is beyond me. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen in one of these movies. It's just everything from the acting to the awkwardness of it to how strange it is that the letter is there and he hadn't noticed. Honestly, it's awful. It's so bad. Anyway, um, really enjoyed the Pixies, Gilderoy Lockhart's class. That's fun. Um, we haven't talked about it, but I, I really like that scene. I like every, it's from the book, but like the whole idea of him building them up like they're really dangerous, and then it's just pixies, and then he can't even handle them is great. Uh, that just works really well. Um, the Quidditch sequence is really exciting and fun, but uh, just as a little little nerdy push my glasses up my nose moment, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't sort of bewitch the snitch to go out of bounds like that because then no one will be able to see it. If the snitch had the ability to fly underneath the stands, then it would not be on the pitch and would not be visible to anyone. So the seeker would have zero chance of catching it. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> just, That's a valid, just, uh, a valid yeah. complaint, I think. <laughs> just, it's just a small thing. I don't know, whatever. It's fine. Um, um, just to say, I've uh, I've pulled up on YouTube, someone's put the deleted scenes and the, the filch thing is in that. So yeah, that's definitely not in the movie. Right, okay, fine. It's fucking weird. Um, we've already talked about that. We've already talked about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, quick quote. Just a small nitpick about the about the dueling club Sorry. scene. Go on. Sorry, I have to ask before you do that. Why? What's what's Harry sat on a hill talking to Hagrid, to Hedwig about? <laughs> is that not in the final cut? I can't remember what the conversation is. No. Um, is that not in the final movie? That's in my version. No. That's, in the, that's in the extended cut. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, yeah, but that's how, that's because it's in this deleted scenes collection, so that's... I think that's it's, I think it's him talking, he's talking to Hedwig, Hedwig about, like, not being sure about, like, his heritage and, like, you know, because he's not, you know, could he be causing this and, like, he's, you know, the, it's, when, it's, yeah. it's during that section of the movie where the school's kind of all against Harry because they all think he's, uh, he's, he's the, 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 the opening of the chamber. <laughs> You've you've given it a lot more nuance than the dialogue gives it if the captions are correct, which is Harry simply saying, Who am I? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're really you're really reading from that. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go out on a limb, Dan, and say that your interpretation of that scene is based on more than the dialogue given in within it. <laughs> Excellent. I really enjoy that. Um so uh Carrying on with with my weird, apparently my new section where I just do all my nitpicks right at the end, very in quick fire fashion. Um, the plan was to teach the, some people blocking, and they get a volunteer pair to do that, and then they just make them duel, which is not what they were bringing them up for. Very confusing. Um, let's teach them blocking. Yes. Should we have some volunteers we can teach this to demonstrate with? Yes. Okay. D- children, duel. Weird. <laughs> Strange. I don't. That might be in the book too. I don't know, but it's still a nitpick. I, I stand by that one. Um, I find. Oh, this isn't a nitpick so much as just a note that I wrote that I thought was interesting. Yeah, Harry is less less hot headed than his book counterpart. Um, in the, uh, you know, he he didn't feel the need to sort of 
say something to the Hufflepuffs when he overheard them talking about him. Um, I thought that was good. I liked that. Wait, sorry, say that again, because that might be related to something I was about to bring up. Say it again. So there's, the Hufflepuffs are talking about Harry, and in the in the book he approaches them and is angry about it, and he makes himself look worse. Um, and in the film he chooses not to say anything, he just sort of quietly wanders off. And I think uh, the, the, the book version of this character is more hot-headed than the film version, and I think that's fine and probably good. So so also not in the film. So I was literally about to bring this up because I, I sensed earlier when we were talking about how well the notion of is this Harry, is he the bad guy was done was slightly different. We didn't talk about it, but like I, for me, the, the Justin character is sort of there, but not there. That scene you're describing is is featured on this deleted scenes Holy collection, shit, man. suggesting that, that's, that's not in the book. Okay, yeah. so wow. Um, so, so for context, God. it's a scene where it's the library, by the looks of it, yep. and the Hufflepuffs are talking, suggesting he attacked Justin and he uh, posing that he might be the heir of Slithering. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's not um, that's on this deleted scenes collection, and I certainly didn't see it yesterday. So yeah, wow. I I've got to be careful if this happens again. No, I, I think there's only two. I think only the first and the second one have quote unquote extended versions because. Um, I've got to be careful not to let that happen again because that's, yeah, that's going to cause more confusion. What's the scene in the version you saw? Then does Hermione go to hospital because she's got a tail? Because there's also a scene of Ron and Hermione, Ron and Harry in robes talking to Hermione in the hospital. But she, I don't think she, that can't be after she's petrified, is it? So does she end up in hospital because of the polyjuice po- polyjuice potion going wrong? Is she unconscious or is she conscious? She's conscious. She's chatting to them. Oh. And she's Talk, in the bed? Talking about how they know the name Tom Marvolo Riddle. Oh, no, that's in the movie. Yeah, yeah, that's in the movie. That's after the... No, it's yeah, in the movie that, you that, saw. It's not, it's, not, it's not in the movie I saw. That's why I'm wondering where, when that takes place. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, I think that's... Yeah, I think it's after... Yeah, it's, it's after the cat stuff. Right, yeah, in the, in the film, she, in, the, in the non-extended cut, she just... Like they don't, she doesn't go to hospital. She just like uh, it just ends on the cat stuff, basically. That's oh, why well, I was just, like, they don't explain this... why she's normal. Like, <laughs> yeah, for context, there's only seven minutes, but that seven minutes like makes a difference. There's also what looks like a fun scene of Crab and Goyle bumping into Crab and Goyle. Yeah, was that not in your? Oh my god, these that's... are all great moments. Okay, wow. All right, no, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and tell people they should probably watch the extended cut because there are two yeah. things that should be cut. And one is the filch stuff, and one is the Borgin stuff. Because as much as I enjoy the Borgin stuff because of the coin moment and things, the problem with the Borgin stuff is it sets up the Muggle Protection Act, and then there's no payoff yeah. for that in the end of the movie. Well, so weirdly, the Borgin the Borgin thing though, it's weird because most of the scene that is featured in the deleted scenes compilation I'm watching, we do see. We see his hand reach out. We see it grab it grab him. Like, but we just don't get the interaction at the end and we don't get the Draco Lucius stuff. So they've really mm-hmm. only trimmed that scene by like 30 seconds. Um, but yeah. Are you sure? Because it's, it's a fair bit of them talking in the version that I had, where, you know, where he's talking to Borgin and debating. But maybe they're and... always talking. Maybe the dialogue is always heard in the background or something. I don't know. But anyway, or maybe they've, maybe this YouTube edit doesn't have the whole thing. But anyway, that's there. There's a scene with Colin Creevy. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Great Hall, which yes, that's, is oh, is that, that's not in the movie either. Oh, that's a good scene. Well, there were there was some scenes with Colin Creevely in this one specifically. Uh, oh, he's introducing himself. I saw. I swear, I've seen this. Maybe it's an extended version or something. Mm, maybe. Um, well, there you go. We've learned something new. Um, the, the, I've just double checked. No other version of these movies has an extended version, so this can't happen again. So apologies for anyone listening that it's a bit confusing. We've ended up watching different versions. It was pure accident. I didn't realize until I was midway through that that, that, that it was longer than the internet had told me because I paused it to make up a tea, and I saw the runtime. Went wait a minute, wasn't this only supposed to be like two hours and forty minutes? Why is it like two hours and fifty? Like I was like, what, 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 yeah. what is this? And then I realized it was an extended version. Anyway, um. Harry talking to the hat. Good moment. Glad they've included it. Really de- de- demonstrates yes. his self-doubt um, at this stage. Even he doesn't necessarily believe he's innocent, which is, I think, a really f- cool angle on it. Because I think in the book, he's pretty clear that it's not him. 
and he's frustrated that the school thinks otherwise. Uh, but here they play it as he doubts himself even and wonders if he could be involved. And that's actually, I think, quite a powerful notion. Um, so yeah, I think I like that. Um, this is a, a problem they've inherited, a nitpick that they're inheriting from the book. And I double-checked, the line is almost word for word. But the Dumbledore just being like, the Phoenix has healing tears and can carry heavy things. And I'm like, hmm, those two facts will definitely not become relevant later in this movie. <laughs> um, when they're talking to Malfoy and trying to get him to give up the secret, you know, whether he's the heir or not, him just taking a present, asking if it's one of theirs, and when they say no, pocketing it is brilliant. That's just great. That's just very Malfoy. I love it. He also randomly rips a page out of a book in the bookshop, and I was like, what? Yeah. "Is that is is that relevant, or is he just being a cock?" I think he's <laughs> just being a cock. Um, I will say as well, by the way, if you freeze frame it, when Lucius slides the the uh, book back into Ginny's cauldron, he you can clearly see the diary, Riddle's diary, being slid oh, back into. I don't think you even need to freeze frame it. I thought they lingered on it quite a bit. Oh um, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I just saw some screenshots afterwards. I didn't, I didn't notice it in the moment. Um, we've already talked about that. Sorry, last couple, and then we can go on to the trove. Sorry about this. I, I maybe I won't do this for the next one because this has taken longer than I thought. Um, how? Well, they, actually, the part of the reason this part has taken so long is because we discovered that, <laughs> that there's a bunch of things I saw that you didn't. <laughs> um, how did no one notice the paper in Hermione's hand? They properly investigated Colin Creevy, looked at his camera, opened it. The paper in Hermione's hand yeah, is pretty that. obvious. <laughs> I found that weird. Um, really enjoyed um, the memory spell backfiring in, the, in this version of it. Um, such a satisfying end for Lockhart, and I just they do they do at least give him one or two moments of being weird and funny in the chamber. Um, because just am I right in think, remembering that they do have the moment where he's like, "This is almost like magic." Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. When they're when they're when they're flying away with with forks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. They do have that. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's very good. Uh, yeah, I've I've made note of this. I everything in the chamber itself that's dialogue is bad. Um, Tom's big exposition speech isn't great. I don't like visually showing me that the bird has blinded the basilisk, and then having Tom say, "Your bird may have blinded the bag of basilisk, but it can still hear you." Um, show don't tell movie. Show don't tell. Like, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> Real bad dialogue. Not good. Doesn't need to be there. Um, Harry grabs the sword out of the hat like he's expecting it to be there. I would have been like, mate, just do one more take and be at least a slightly bit surprised and hesitate. <laughs> like, oh, is that? A- yeah, oh my God, it's a sword. Just something. Uh, 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 split second. Just He, he takes it out of that hat with so much confidence. It's like he knew it was going to be there. It's weird. <laughs> Well, he sees it forming, and I know it's I know it's cleaner to like have the hat on the floor and then the sword, like us see the sword appear in it. But I so prefer how that's done in the book, where he's like wearing the hat and then it drops on his head. <laughs> Is that what happens? I remember in the being book. On the floor. He, in the book, he grabs the sorting hat, puts it on his head, and is like, "Help me, help me!" And it sends him the sword. I'm sure I might be wrong, but I, that's definitely my memory of it Ooh. from the book. In the oh, in the film, there's a shot of the the cats on the floor, and then the sword materializes within the hat. Fascinating. I thought it was that way in both. Let me check. That's very interesting. If that's different, where am I up to? Uh, the heir of Slytherin is the name of the chapter. He's asking Tom to help him. Uh, I bet Dumbledore's. Oh, here we go. Here's the I am Lord Voldemort bit. God damn it! Where's the sword? This is going to take way longer than it needs to. But I'm curious, because I'm that's not how I remember it at all. Oh, here we go. You're right. Good memory. Boom. Two, twice twice a day. Two points to Billingham. Yeah. Yeah, we're just in small visual detail. Like, like you know, it's, it, both of them were, like, physical things that happened that I remembered slightly differently. Like, the, the sock on the book and then the, the sword coming out of that. So, he puts that on. Help me, help me. Wait, does he... S- Oh. oh, no, wait a second, wait a second. Harry seized it. It was all he had left, his only chance. Oh, yeah, he rammed it onto his head and threw himself onto the floor. Help me, help me. Uh, there was no answering voice. Instead, the hat contracted 
as though an invisible hand squeezing very tightly. Something very hard and heavy thud- thudded onto the top of Harry's head, almost knocking him out. <laughs> Stars winking in front of his eyes. He grabbed the top of the hat, pulled it off, yeah. and felt something long and hard beneath it. You're right. Ooh, that's a... <laughs> that's phrasing. Um, <laughs> um, spe- speaking of the sword, what the fuck? This really sharp, powerful sword. And at the end of the film, Harry's literally holding it by the fucking blade. Like... <laughs> Yeah. What's going on well, there, movie? There's movies. two parts of that, Chris. I didn't like that he grabbed it by the blade because the blade is filthy with blood and I wouldn't have touched it with the blood, but hand me it by the handle, please. Dumbledore, I'm not touching all this fucking blood. <laughs> Number one. But certainly but not in a way that I'm going to cut my, you know, the third but, film is Harry Potter and the Hepatitis. <laughs> like, yeah. And then, yeah, and then the second point of just, yeah, is it supposed to be super sharp, Harry? You can't just grab it by the blade. Yeah, no, that's dumb. Um, last two notes that I've got. Um, moving on to just get this done so we can get to the trivia. Uh, Basilisk, I'm not sure I like the design. I think it's kind of clunky and weird. I, I like that they tried to merge practical with CGI. I don't think the final product works as well as it could. Um, and it looks more like a monster than a true snake. And I guess that's a, that's a choice, but like, I, I don't care for that choice. And then my final note, um, all the exams are cancelled, is and will always be insane. <laughs> yeah, because what got me about that is... It's fine, and I think that happens in the book as well, doesn't it? It but does, but in I the think... book, you can potentially fansplain it in a way you can't in the film. So in the book, McGonagall approaches the table and says it as a school treat, exams will be cancelled. You could argue she's saying that to the, specifically the, the, you know, the second years, third years, you know, the exactly, ones that aren't cause... doing exams that they need to get jobs later like you can't cancel the exams for the students doing the owls and the newts (laughs) yeah that's exactly exactly what i was gonna say like it makes sense for harry's year but anyone doing owls and newts like they need those qualifications yeah (laughs) what do you mean my exams are cancelled have i got to do an extra year here like what is this (laughs) so there you go yeah it's weird right cool there we go so let's 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 finally dan let's let's trim it up Triv it up. I'm going to give you some trivia. And I'll go through this as quick as I there can because we are running out of time. Uh, Jude Law was d- deemed too young to play Gilderoy Lockhart. He did audition for him, though. Uh, he would later play Albus Dumbledore in Fantastic Beasts, Crimes of Grindelwald. Uh, Hugh Grant was originally cast as Lockhart. Actually cast, um, but was forced to withdraw at the last moment because of a scheduling conflict with a movie called Two Weeks Notice. Uh, good choice, Hugh Grant. Um, look, I think Hugh Grant would have been great in the role. I love Hugh Grant. I think he's very good. I think this would have actually really put his career on a different path and, and potentially a very good one. We would have gotten even more good, goofy Hugh Grant over-the-top performances. Um, he's found his way to those roles in recent years, but this would have got him there sooner, I think, and that is a shame. But with that said, I mean, come on. Kenneth Branagh, born to be born to be Gilderoy Lockhart and um yeah yeah. and and also I like the fact that Hugh Grant had to find his way there through more dramatic roles um like the film where he the film about the the music the the older musician it's got it's got the guy from that plays Howard in the Big Bang Theory and I can't remember what that film's called and obviously um a very British scandal, which is still one of my favorite Hugh Grant performances ever so oh you're you're doing Florence Foster Jenkins Yes, that's it. That's yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, that that movie is is a comedy, but he he plays a he's oh god, he's amazing in that movie. The the the, the, the performance he gives in that film is is still one of my favorite of his his entire work, and, and that's a good movie actually. I, I'd recommend that movie. If people haven't had a chance to see it. It's good. Um, Richard E. Grant and Bill Nighy were both considered for the role of Lucius Malfoy. Uh, obviously, the latter would later sign on in Deathly Hallows to play uh, Rufus Scrimger. But uh, yeah, uh, didn't work out in this case. Jason Isaacs had actually, um, who ends up playing, uh, who ends up playing that role, Lucius Malfoy, ended up actually, uh, sorry, had originally auditioned for Gilderoy Lockhart. Uh, Christopher Columbus had asked him to try for Lucius too, but Isaacs wasn't really fond of the idea because it was too similar to his role as Captain Hook in the 2003 Peter Pan movie. Um, but he was too polite to say no. Um, and then, yeah, apparently, according to the, the story, when he was offered the part, he almost turned it down, but his family convinced him to do it. Um, so he then clearly had a change of heart once he was in the role because he made a lot of changes to the, 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 the character from what was in the, on the page in terms of visuals. He insisted on the long hair to distinguish him from Draco, um, but he also obviously needed to keep the hair from falling in front of his face for the scenes. So that meant he had to sort of 
perform with his head tilted back the entire time, which actually ended up adding to the snobbishness of the character because it means he's always looking down his nose at everyone. Um, and apparently it was also his idea to have a walking stick, um, like a cane, that then had his wand built into the top of it. That was his idea, apparently. And uh, apparently he was so fond of it um, through production, he nearly he tried to steal it on the last day and was, was thwarted. <laughs> the props department got, got, got him, I guess, because they knew that he'd probably be appearing in future movies and they'd need it. <laughs> um, oh, oh, he, he tried to steal at it end. at the end of this... He tried to steal it at the end of this movie. Yeah, yeah. I thought, like, he tried to steal it at the end of Deathly Hallows Part 2 or something, which would have like, kind of been like, oh, they should have just given it to him. But no, yeah. trying to steal it on this movie is is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, Chris Columbus was unsure about these ideas for Malfoy's costume and hair and voice. And he just, I don't know, he, he had some doubts about Isaac's choices, but apparently it was Daniel Radcliffe who commented he thought the changes were really cool and Columbus went along with it. The words really cool are in quote marks here, so I want to hope that's exactly what Daniel Radcliffe said <laughs> ah the kid says it's really cool <laughs> um so uh shirley henderson who plays Moni myrtle is the oldest actress to portray a hogwarts student she was 37 when she played this role <laughs> um Jesus. she's wonderful in this role um i'm a big fan of she's shirley brilliant, henderson. but <laughs> that's maddening and you can't you can't tell it's fine but well i think if crazy. she was in you know, f- flesh and blood on, on set, you yes, might yeah, yeah, would have been. But because she's a ghost, she's kind of vaguely present, not present. She's kind of a, uh, shimmery and stuff. You get away with that, I think. But yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. Um, I've met Shirley uh, in real life, and she is absolutely lovely. One of the nicest people I've, uh, I've oh, met. Oh, wonderful. Of the, of the wonderful famous people I've met. Well. So she's a, she's an absolute she's a, she's a, she's a, she's, a, she's a real gent as they say, um, but usually about agreed. Yeah, that's a, I, I just realized it's a weird way to describe someone, but like I, but that's that's what I that's what I st- said and that's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> she's a real gent. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe was apparently only offered a hundred and twenty five thousand for the role. Um, only but, he was like twelve years old. <laughs> Yes, but as we've talked about in the past, actors are worth what the movie is worth, right? Like, he's the well, star yes, of true. a movie that's going to make millions and millions of dollars. The, and they were the movie is him. called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, right. you, you, I, I, I take it back. You, you raise a good point. Yeah, so Actors' Equity uh, Union actually stepped in to negotiate new terms because this was deemed absolutely unacceptable and that he was basically being taken advantage of considering um and they uh upped his salary to roughly two million which is quite a jump but considering how many millions this movie would have made you know absolutely um when hagrid is escorting harry out of nocturne alley um and it, oh no no we'll come back to this one this one's a this one's a not true this is a trivia that was put in and then I looked into it, and it turned out to be fake. So at the end of this, I'm going to do some anti-triv. I've got two bits of triv that are commonly said about this movie that are not true. So we're going to come back to that. Um, just like his character, Rupert Grint had such a severe case of arachnophobia that he has still not watched the entire scene of Ron and Harry in ha- Aragog's Hollow. Um, so there you go. Apparently a lot of his looks of terror are real because they had puppets and stuff on set for the spiders. <laughs> so there you go. Um during production, Emma Watson frequently brought her pet hamster Millie to the set. Unfortunately, Millie passed away shortly after shooting began. The set uh, department created a specifically made hamster coffin complete with velvet lining and the name Millie engraved on the top. Watson has since said, I don't think a hamster has ever had a better send off. <laughs> wow. I mean, I mean, so here's the thing. That's yeah. lovely. That's awesome. That's really treasured. I think it's really sweet that they were that they did that for her. I think that's I think that's brilliant. Also, didn't they have enough to do? <laughs> That's true. There is a point. There's a point there where you're just like, that seems like a lot of time wasted on a coffin for a hamster. But that's fine. Um, yeah, very strange. Uh, during the course of Harry Potter movies... No, I'm, jo- I'm joking. That, that's, that's lovely. That, that's awesome. Yeah, no, it's very sweet. They, they, you know, upset little actress on set. They did something to make her happy. I think that's nice. Um, during the course of the Harry Potter movies, Daniel Radcliffe goes through 160 pairs of glasses. Um... 
Lucius Malfoy and Harry's exchange just before Lucius leaves Dumbledore's office was not in the script and was completely improvised on the spot. So this is the um, let us hope that Mr. Potter will always be around to save the day. Daniel Radcliffe replying, don't worry, I will be. Um, That whole thing was completely improvised and it ended up in the bloody trailer. So... Well, one, that shouldn't be in the trailer because it's from one of the last moments of the film. That's madness. Um, but two, I enjoyed that moment. I thought Radcliffe, again, like Radcliffe was mm-hmm. really coming to it, coming into his own in that moment. I thought that was good. Yeah, that's one, definitely one of the stronger points in the film, for sure. Um, Lockhart states that he didn't get rid of the ba- uh, abandoned Banshee by smiling at him. Now, Banshees are Irish spirits and are generally seen as female. Um, in the book, he correctly uses her. Um, but in this one, Kenneth Branagh says he. Now, people were like, oh, it's just a simple mistake. doesn't really matter. But a, but a lot of people have realized that actually Branagh actually has Irish uh, heritage and Irish background. So it's very likely that he made a deliberate choice to misgender the Banshee to make Lockhart look even more stupid. <laughs> and like he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I think that's really fun. Um, so there you go. Mm, that's a good notion. Yeah. Um, now, uh, what has been noted is uh, this isn't something that the production crew have ever confirmed, but Ron's robes are noticeably grey compared to the black of the other students, including Harry and Hermione. This appears to have been a deliberate choice to indicate that here's our second-hand robes that have been washed many times. Right. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, nurses were drafted into the production because an outbreak of head lice occurred during the filming amongst the young cast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sounds about right. <laughs> Horrific. <laughs> it's yeah, that's what happens, isn't it? You put a bunch that's, of kids together. That's what happens. That's that is... scarier than anything in this film. Yeah. Um, the set of Flourish and Blots is actually a redress of the set that served as Ollivander's wand shop in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I think that's good. That's thrifty. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, yeah, but you know why that is because the props department were too busy making uh, <laughs> making coffins. <laughs> Well, actually, um, I don't think it's in here, but what they were actually doing was making ha- um, Dumbledore's office because Columbus decided Dumbledore's office needed to be the most intricate, incredible set ever in the history of ever. And it took up a bajillion, bajillion percent of the production budget just to make Dumbledore's office. And uh, as a result, I think they had to scrimp elsewhere to make it work. That's genuinely true. Um uh, the title used by the crew to disguise the shoot uh, that was printed on clapperboards was Incident on 57th Street, um, which is apparently the title of a 1973 Bruce Springsteen song. I don't know why that's in here, but yeah, there you go. Um, throughout the eight mov- movie franchise, five different actresses play Pansy Parkinson. So, 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 sorry to go back. Why Why did they need to disguise what they were shooting? Like... The book was out. There was no need to hide spoilers. Everyone knows it was, the film was uh, being made. Why? N- uh, it's not so much to just... It's so that when they... Um, we talked about this, I think, when we did the, the Star Wars movies and the, the whole Blue Harvest thing. Um, people, when they know your production is a oh, famous yeah, movie, yeah, right, yeah. Charge, you, you. charge you more yeah. for like sets and stuff. And also, if, if, if you send out a letter to the local community, we're going to be filming on your street... Yes. And you yeah, don't, if you, you, yeah. you know, if you say Harry Potter, you're attracting a big crowd. And if you don't, you, you don't. Yeah, so you're right. Sorry. Yeah, that makes complete mm. sense. Carry on. Anyways, uh, throughout the eight movies, uh, five different actresses play Pansy Parkinson, a Slytherin student and a friend of uh, Draco Malfoy's. So um, very quickly, I'm going to read the list because I'm, there's, there's a familiar name in here, Chris. So we're going to have to look out next movie for this. But in Philosopher's Stone, it's Catherine, uh, Catherine Nicholson uh, in, wait, Genevieve this one, no, wait, sorry. This one must be this movie. Genevieve Gaunt in... It says Azkaban, but I think this must mean Chamber. Charlotte Ritchie in Prisoner of Azkaban. Although really? just credited, oh Yeah, although just credited as student. And Laura Shotton in Order of the Phoenix. Um, and then someone called Scarlett Hefner in Half-Blood Prince, Deathly Hallows, Parts 1 and 2. So there you really? go. Charlotte Ritchie apparently plays Pansy Parkinson. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, in, um, in in Goblet of Fire. In, no, in Azkaban. Just, uh, according to Harry Potter fandom and her Harry Potter wiki, it's Goblet of Fire. So I don't know if there's maybe. Oh, uh, so is... well, I did say that there was a there was a different actress listed. There was two actresses listed for Azkaban. So maybe the other actress was Azkaban and she was Goblet, and this is just a mix up on the. On the okay, you go, yeah. Right? So yeah, but still, maybe. she yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll have to keep our eyes out for that. That's kind of a fun idea. That's a fun, both fans of that actress would be interested to see. It'd be weird to see her so young, to be honest, because we we both mm. know her mostly from when she started in Fresh Meat, where she was like sort of 
uni age. So it'll be weird to see a very young Charlotte Ritchie ring around these sets um, in the background. Uh, the Weasley car is a four. Oh yeah, sorry, we're we're we're, we're here, Chris. We're at cars exist. <laughs> Uh, the Weasley car is a Ford Anglia, the same colour and model of car in which J.K. Rowling and her best friend from school used to ride around in when they were younger. Um, she used oh, the car sweet. in the book and then later the movie uh, out of her fond memories of driving around in it. And as we did in the last, it's worth noting because I've mentioned her name, as we said in the last podcast, if anyone's wondering, we obviously, you know, J.K. Rowling, bad. We understand, you know, it's weird anti-trans stuff is, is not good. We're, we're, we're acknowledging that and we're not making it a big thing because what can you do right we're, we're talking about these movies um as, as separately as we can from the the recent behavior of the creator <laughs> so i we should have said that at yeah. the top uh, but in case anyone hasn't listened to the first one where we explain that just to, to cover it here um apparently 14 ford anglias were destroyed to create the scene in which harry and ron crash into the whomping willow that's madness oh, wow. but there you go uh you wouldn't think they'd need that many but yeah and then, um, finally, Chris, a new segment, Cameras Exist. Chick, chick. Great. Great <laughs> very, stuff. Very quickly. Uh, the camera used by Colin Creevy is an Argus C3 Matchmatic, a cheap, very popular 35mm camera, uh, a rangefinder camera, uh, that was manufactured in the US from 1939 to 1966. Now, nice. very quickly, anti-triv. Two pieces of trivia were in the trivia that were false, and I want to talk about it because I think they're interesting. Um... Uh, so this is the trivia as it reads in the in the uh, in the in the in the IMDb uh, and then on a few different websites and other places. When Hagrid is escorting Harry out of Nocturne Alley, and again when Lockhart turns to show his profile to the photographer, hardcover editions of the Harry Potter books can be seen on the shelves. This is false. I've zoomed in on these books on the Blu-ray release. They are not Harry Potter books. They're called Witch Wizard um, and have black and white photos of various wizards on the front of them. Um, they are not the Harry Potter books because one, that wouldn't make any sense, but two, if that was there as an Easter egg, um, that just would be a weird thing to do. Um, so no, the Harry Potter books are not on display. The other one is that the opal necklace, which um, it plays a prominent role in Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince, can be briefly glimpsed in a display case in Borgen and Burks in Nocturne Alley. In Nocturne Alley, this is a coincidence. Guess what, everyone? The film was released in two thousand and one. The book that uses the necklace. Wasn't released until 2005. Fuck off. Well, I, I agree that's probably a... Co- that, is, that is almost definitely a coincidence. In fairness to those people, JK could have told them. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. But it's, that seems like but a very you small... Were gonna, she's not going to... She, she, she'd give them broad strokes. She, there's no way she was like, right, but recently, I'm releasing a book in four years' time that has a necklace in it. Do you want to make it show up here? Well, also, also to be fair, if anything was going to be there, it would be the vanishing cabinet, wouldn't it? <laughs> exactly. So, if know, anything was going to be deliberate, second. it would be the cabinet. So, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Right. So there you go. We got through the triv and the anti-triv. Um, so here we are. We so, and, yeah. overall thoughts, Chris. Uh, I, I really like this one. Uh, so, uh, I think it's top top tier stuff. What are you thinking? Yeah, I, 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 I rank it higher than Philosophers. I've really enjoyed both. I, I approach next week with fascination. I've gone up and down on this film. First time, really didn't like it. Thought there was no way you'd be able to understand the end, uh, the like last 20 minutes, unless you'd read the book. Was was talking about that in the car ride home from seeing it for the first time. Um, and love the book. Recent rewatch actually went, you know what, as a movie, it, it, I can see why people like it so much. So I'm going to be fascinated to see where I land after uh, after this time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm feeling the same. I'm, but maybe not so... I, I have the same concerns about the whether the movie makes sense as it, on its own, uh, because I remember this be, it being on one Christmas with family present and just having to field a lot of questions. Mm. So it was, you know, it wasn't, we weren't in a cinema, obviously, it was just on TV, so it's fine, we weren't disturbing anyone else to do that, but it was a lot of like, who's that, what's that, why is that, you know, and me having to go, right, mm, in the book, uh, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. so it will be interesting to see if that, if that is true of the movie, when I sort of but, try to analyse it more objectively, this, through this format. It, I will also admit to a huge bias because it is my favourite book, and specifically those last chapters are incredible in the book. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm. Uh, and, but, I'm but, ex- 
excited. I, oh, well, I was just going to say, I would add that I'm, my more, uh, like, well, will this turn out? How will this turn out? Is that I know this is the movie that starts the trend of, like, the, the, the visuals going in a much more gothic direction. Um, yeah, and, and the clothes. The tone. The, even, it, even just looking at the poster just now, they're, mm-hmm. they're all the in, like, Mobile normal clothes. clothes. And it winds me up because it's so it it it's so it creates such a nice aesthetic. Everyone being in robes in these first two films. <laughs> yeah, and I just think like from my perspective, like you know, okay, do you want to make it seem like oh, okay, young kids, you know, they're they're not robes are like old fuzzy duddy footy duddy wizard things. You know, kids have adapted to muggle clothes a lot better, and that that is kind of a little bit in the book where like. Harry, Ron, Hermione have to explain what a kilt is. Like, you know, like I, 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 I vaguely remember that coming up. And there's a few moments like that where it's clear that the muggle kids, uh, sorry, the wizard kids do also like wear jeans and t-shirts and stuff. Like that comes up. But when they're at the school, it's clear they run around in robes. Uh, uh, you know, whereas this kind of makes the robes school uniform and only school uniform. Then again, to be fair, to to be fair, I think Chamber does this too. Like I've just look, I'm flicking through it now, and when they're running around the school yeah, yeah, yeah. during lessons, they're wearing the robes. But actually, like towards the like when they're in the forest, they're not wearing robes. Out of school hours, they're just Ron's wearing a little jumper. Oh, I suppose at Christmas as well, yeah. And even in that last, in the in the in the whole in the sorry, the, I'm thinking philosophers here. That last, that whole last sequence, they're not in robes. In mm. you know when they're doing the chessboard and stuff, Harry's in a red jumper. Yeah, so maybe it's always just kind of been they wear the robes for classes, but because these movies mm. slowly do less and less stuff in the actual classes and in the school, that that that, that shifts. We'll yeah. we'll see. We'll judge it as we go. Um, yeah, but. But yeah, um, I, I so I'll be, my my bigger intrigue in the next one. Other than well, I mean that is still you know your 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 point on like whether it makes sense or not will be a big will be a big discussion point. I don't doubt, but I'm also very curious about the visual changes. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Yes, and it's 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 worth saying here. Final note, because um, obviously this was Christopher Columbus, uh, the last movie directed by him. I think he did such a wonderful job oh, of God. capturing the magical side of things and setting up, you know, how things looked. Uh, there were changes to that, which we, we will talk about. But um, I think Christopher Columbus did an did a wonderful job creating two magical films for children and the family just really old school family adventure films um and yeah he uh he did a, he did a great job on these first two movies mm-hmm. no i 100 percent agree i think he's uh i i honestly like i i think it's all downhill from here folks so i've got a like he's <laughs> he's 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 got he's got um I don't know if it's just that he had the easier job of adapting the shorter books and that the problems that come up with the later movies would have come up had these been bigger books being compressed, I I, I don't know. I guess, well, I guess we'll never know. You know, it would have been nice to have Columbus come back and do one of the later ones, actually, to sort of, you know, uh, to sort of have him sort of almost finish what he started. Um, and also to see if, you know, could he have brought that magic back to those later movies when that was sort of waning? But, you know, the, the problem is they were so successful the movies there wasn't a sense of that you know they were they were making more and more money each time it seemed so you know from a studio's perspective why why bring columbus back in there's no reason you know uh, what's his face is doing a, is doing a what because towards the end it's the same director isn't it the last couple yes david like, yates yeah that's it yates yates doesn't and he's done all the fantastic beast ones as well i think um yeah so you know so. Well, why fix it if it ain't broke, I suppose? And and, and their metric for whether it, it's broke is, is how much money it's making. So, yeah. Yeah. It's no, it's, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to, to carry on. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Yeah, hopefully, um, I, because this was a longer movie, I think that's why this has been a bit slightly longer podcast, but... We're still we're only at two, uh, two and a half hours is actually shorter than I imagined it might be to be honest. Um, there's a lot to cover. Um, so yeah, hopefully next time we can curb our in the book stuff because it goes a bit further. Oh, then again, no, I think we're gonna. That's no, it's gonna get worse. <laughs> Just accept it's gonna get worse. No, I think it's gonna get worse for that one and then better after that because 
I think we, yeah. th- th- I think both of us have that thought about the next one. Not sure if it functions without the context of the book because it's quite a complicated book in terms of all the reveals and the backstory of all the characters. So I don't know if you know the, that yeah, plays cause, out because it, 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 it gets to a, it gets to a point where you can't moan at certain things not being adapted because they just can't be. But it's going to be interesting because my it's going to be certainly interesting next week and then the the, the week after is going to be fascinating because my memory of the Goblet of Fire on rewatch. My most recent rewatch was me sitting there going, oh, fuck, this is just a collection of scenes. Like, it's literally just a collection of bits. So, yeah, we will. We shall it's see. Gonna, it's going to be interesting because the... The, the, the latter half of these movies, Chris, I've only ever seen once. Like, I don't think I've ever seen yeah. Deathly Hallows separate to the cinema. I don't think I've ever seen. I don't think I saw Half the Prince again after the cinema i think i i think like five to ten years ago i went back to them to try and i was thinking about doing like um you know reviews on like youtube or whatever and i started going back through them and making notes and i think i got as far as gobbler or maybe order but i think i stopped there so i've these ones uh so these first two i've seen a couple times in my lifetime the next couple uh, after azkaban I've, I've only ever seen them twice and then i think after order i've only ever seen them the once and never I think again I'm so, so well, I, I definitely i've I've definitely seen them twice, maybe. I feel like the later ones I watched on my own, but then also watched with my parents, and then when we did the rewatch, watched them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, but anyway, yeah, it's going to be, it's gonna uh, be really see. interesting to go back to some of these. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Right, where can so, the where can the people get us, Dan? Well, all the usual places, Chris. You can get us on Patreon, patreon.com slash nothing but static if you wish to hear us talk about Prisoner of Azkaban right now. It's up on there a week early. Unless of course you're already listening to this through the Patreon, in which case I'm very sorry. Um you're already a week ahead. We can't doesn't we can't make this infinite. <laughs> so you'll have to wait a week to listen to the next one. Um but yeah, if you're listening to us on Spotify or iTunes or any of those places, you can get Azkaban by giving as little as one dollar a month. We also do our other podcast, style, Analyzing Avatar, a week early on there. And occasionally put up um, extra content, although we haven't done that in a long time. So, uh, you know, bonus content that's just exclusive to the Patreon. It's kind of rare at the moment. We're busy and we're doing these weekly and they're taking up a lot of our time. Um, the notes yeah, and the turns, trivia it turns alone. Out, t- turns out the movie ones take a lot longer. We, we've, we instead of going back to shorter cartoons of uh, the, av- the world of Avatar, we've stuck with movies. So, uh, yeah, we are, uh, yeah. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. There's not not likely to happen anytime soon. But yeah, we're, that's where you can we're get really us. having. It, we're, we're really having like Dan. And, for context, Dan and I should not be recording this morning. We started this at seven a.m. to fit it in. We are both absolutely exhausted after horrendous weeks. So yeah, uh, uh, apologies. Um, but yeah, we there's there will be no extra content. I think till at least these are these are done, and then maybe even the next rewind reviews. But when it comes, mm-hmm. it will be glorious. Nothing but claps, yes. part two, baby. It's worth yes, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it will be, and hopefully, it'll be so long you won't remember the questions. <laughs> oh no, because we're yes, going to give them you in advance good. anyway. So yeah, you'll you'll have to remember them anyway. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so the other places you can support us is just by going to all the various platforms that we're on and liking, subscribing, and doing all that stuff. So you can, uh, you know, hearts and thumbs ups and all sorts of review systems that exist across iTunes and Spotify and all the various platforms. YouTube as well. Uh, YouTube.com slash nothing but static UK. If you want to subscribe to us on there, that is also appreciated. Even if you don't necessarily watch the content on there, feel free to drop comments if you have them on the youtube channel on the relevant video so if you've got a comment about this very podcast that you want to get to us the best place to do it is actually go to the youtube find the video for this and if you don't watch it there and you listen to this on spotify or whatever you can throw your comment underneath and we will see it um, i try to get back to them but often i don't get a chance but I, we, will, we will try maybe maybe you know your comment is so interesting i'll be forced to respond even though i'm in the middle of a thing you never know. That does sometimes happen. <laughs> That's where I'm just like, no, I have to, re- I have to reply immediately to this one. <laughs> it's caught my eye. Um, so yeah, feel free to drop your thoughts there. You can also email us mail at nothingbutstatic.co.uk um, or I think oh your Twitter Twitter at Dan Doolan for me at C Billingham with two M's for Chris or at nothing but static without the G if you wish to get us on Twitter. Um, yeah, that's the, the the contact places. The other thing you could do if you want to continue supporting the show is tell a friend. Say, hey, there's this podcast. You got a friend who likes Harry Potter? You probably have, right? We all have. We all know people who like Harry Potter. It's very popular, turns out. Um, let them know that we've done this. They can listen to this. Yeah, spread absolutely. it around. Tell them. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Spread it, spread it around. Like an illness. (laughs) 
and and that is the uh, first. Maybe like the scene, like the scene from uh, like a, like the scene from a pandemic movie, like Contagion or whatever. Well, our, our estimates show that if one person has it today and passes it on to two people, and those two people pass it on to f- to two people, this will grow exponentially, and in twenty four hours, everyone will have listened to Harry Potter and the We Rewind reviews. <laughs> I I like the notion that when I said we were exhausted, someone went because I think our energy's been good in this, and someone someone would be thinking maybe oh they don't seem exhausted, and then you went pass it around <laughs> like a pff, illness, and they went and then they in their heads went oh no they they are exhausted. Yeah. I can't stress enough, guys. We've got a full day to, and I'm certainly not going to bed early because um, I've got to do something after. Yeah, so we've we got a full day ahead of us, people. And we're anyway. recording again first Sorry. thing tomorrow morning for something different. <laughs> yeah. We're not even we're not even catching up on sleep tomorrow because we're also recording. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, for, oh no, you, you you've been doing the end ones for the. Oh no, I've been doing it, haven't I? Oh, what yeah, three hundred reviews. Right, I, right, I, I think last week I kind of lot forgot myself and did it, but I shouldn't have. It was it's, it's your ending. It's three hundred. No, I, I've got it. I remember what it is. I, I I couldn't remember what I I I did it in the end, but I couldn't remember what I did. But I've got it now. So uh, okay, I've been Chris Billingham. I've been Dan Doolan. And this review from the Wizarding World has been rewound. Sweet. There you go. I still re- I still resent from the the wizarding world thing. <laughs>